Well good, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual Pacific Urban Forum 2021. This is a great day, and there's been much planning for this event. We'd like to welcome you all today. It's going to be a very interesting and extensive program. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, country representatives from around the Pacific and from quite a few of the development partners as well. We'll be taking a deep dive into sustainable urban development in the Pacific and the progress, particularly the progress since the last Pacific Urban Forum two years ago, the challenges, and we're all experiencing many challenges, uh, the trends, but also the solutions that are emerging, particularly in partnership with some of our development organisations across the region. The program breaks up into roughly two sections. The first section will be hearing from the countries on their progress. Uh, there'll be a, a short break, uh, and then we'll be hearing from the development partners uh, as to some of their initiatives, and then moving on to an interactive session before we end. So we hope that you'll be able to stay with us for the, for the entire session. It should be very productive, very interesting. Uh, just a little bit of um, some housekeeping details first. Uh, as you've seen, the webinar is being recorded. Um, your microphones are muted for the main part of the session, but you will be able to ask questions and speak in the interactive session towards the end of the program. Uh, we have both a chat and a Q&A function. So I uh, would ask you to put your questions in the Q&A and we'll be able to keep track of those. But if you'd like to raise other issues, make comments, um, put up links for resources, et cetera, please use the chat function. Okay, so I think we're ready to roll. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Atsushi Koresawa, who's the regional representative of UN Habitat Office for Asia and the Pacific to um, provide the welcome. Thank you, Mr. Koresawa. Thank you and good morning. Uh, distinguished delegates and representatives from uh, national and local government across the Pacific, dear participants and colleagues, uh, it is my utmost pleasure uh, to welcome you to this virtual Pacific Urban Forum on behalf of the members of Pacific uh, Partnership for the New Urban Agenda, CLGF, Compass Housing, ERF, SCAP, ICRE, Melbourne and Monash University, and of course, my own uh, organization, UN Habitat. We very much appreciate you, you are taking time uh, to participate in today's uh, event. It is now more than two years since the fifth Pacific Urban Forum, FUF5, was held in Nandi, uh, Fiji, in July 2019, which I had the honor to attend. At FUF5, uh, participating countries made voluntary commitment to implement the Pacific New Urban Agenda and set ambitious uh, target to achieve sustainable urban development. Since 2005, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a tremendous impact on urban areas and livelihoods and create new global, regional, national and local development challenges that must be addressed. There is a, clearly a new need to accelerate action on new urban agenda and promote greater partnership and collaboration for sustainable urban development across the Pacific region. The Pacific Partnership for the New Urban Agenda will support just uh, this, and I look forward to a uh, formal launch of the Pacific Partnership for the New Urban Agenda with our country partners, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> and regional urban uh, participants um, today, uh, practitioners today. Our event today has a number of ob objectives. Together, we will uh, hear updates on the key urban development priorities and national progress towards the Pacific New Urban Agenda as an implementation mechanism for the global new urban agenda from regional uh, country uh, representatives. And we will identify key areas where the Pacific Partnership for the New Urban Agenda and individual members can support and accelerate uh, action on the Pacific New Urban Agenda and COVID-19 uh, <clears throat> recovery. 
and charts the pathway uh, towards the Pacific Urban Forum 6 planned for 2023 in person. We look forward to your engagement to shape a longer term uh, trajectory for sustainable urbanization and human settlement development in the Pacific. Based on your inputs today, uh, we will develop our 2021-2022 project and capacity building uh, programs of our partnership. We will also develop a regional informal settlements and housing strategy uh, based on feedback today. Moreover, uh, we also aim to deliver a capacity building and expert webinar series on the priority urban challenges which are uh, raised, um, which are raised today. Greater collaboration will be key, uh, will be uh, the key to achieving our shared vision of sustainable ur urban development in the Pacific. And countries can all learn a lot from each other's efforts and progresses. We look forward to this uh, knowledge sharing and working closely uh, with regional partners uh, going forward. I wish you all a successful uh, Pacific Urban Forum event and a fruitful discussion uh, and, and session today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kurosawa. Uh, and that gives us a very good um, sense of how UN Habitat really underpins this, this specific partnership. So that was really useful. Uh, now, for the formal opening, we were to have the Prime Minister of Tuvalu speaking to us, but he's unfortunately unwell. So um, I'd like to invite Terry Parker from the Commonwealth Local Government Forum to speak on his behalf. Um, the Prime Minister of Tuvalu is a patron of CLGF, and Terry's speaking on behalf of the CLGF um, headquarters. So thank you, Terry. Over to you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Steve. Um, and, and firstly, uh, uh, Prime Minister Natano has, uh, has um, asked me to give his sincere apologies for not being able to be present this morning. And, uh, and also from our side, we, we wish him a, a speedy recovery. He's, he's not very well at the moment, but, um, but he, he, he certainly uh, appreciates the opportunity to be uh, invited here this morning and uh, again wishes us a successful day. And he's asked us to, uh, as a CLGF patron, asked us to, uh, uh, to, to present his, uh, his opening remarks, which I, I have the honour to do so. Um, this event comes at a pivotal time for our region. That there has never been a more critical time for the Pacific community to work together on maximising the opportunities and tackling the challenges arising from rapid urbanisation, all in the context of a global pandemic. Towns and cities are, are vital to achieving socioeconomic development in the Pacific. These are where, where many of our people live, where our, where our economies can thrive, and they are the engines for national economic growth. However, at the same time, our urban centres are facing many challenges, inequality, informal settlements, climate vulnerability, and natural disasters, just to mention a few. These are aggravated by the speed of urban growth in the Pacific, which is expected to, more, to be more than double the global average over the next 30 years. In addition, an unprecedented and serious threat has emerged, the COVID-19 pandemic, which has impacted significantly on our people and our economies and exacerbated our vulnerabilities. As small island states, uh, we have the capacity to protect ourselves from the virus, but are also vulnerable if the virus enters, as we have seen. Uh, COVID-19 has necessitated a new way of managing challenges in urban areas. Similarly, the impacts of climate change require urban centres to take action to ensure cities and towns are more resilient. A long-term sustainable and adaptive vision of urban development in the Pacific is needed to tackle these challenges, founded on a commitment to good governance, sensitive and careful integrated planning, effective service delivery, together with fiscal and political empowerment. The new 
uh, the, the Pacific New Urban Agenda presents a strong framework and pathways to achieve this necessary progress. The, inter, inter, uh, the, intercontinent, sorry, the interconnected working areas of this virtual Pacific Urban Forum, which are social equity, environment and resilience, urban economy and urban governance, provide opportunities to learn of activities taking place across the region in support of the new urban, urban agenda. And the Prime Minister is also aware of the, the call to action on sustainable urbanisation across, across the Commonwealth, which will be considered at the forthcoming Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting. This call for a greater focus and practical action on enabling sustainable urbanisation to support cities and human settlements to play their full role in achieving the SDGs will potentially add value at the global level to, to the work being done here in, in the Pacific. And the, the Prime Minister also asked us to emphasise that the, that the Tuvalu government will continue to advocate for attention to the social and economic issues and challenges resulting from ur urbanisation in the Pacific. They remain committed to supporting the concerted efforts to address these by regional mechanisms such as the Pacific Urban Forum. <clears throat> um, and in closing, events such as this forum provide opportunities for Pacific countries, their cities and towns to work together to develop strong networks, share best practices, explore solutions and spark innovation. The best development outcomes are achieved when we all work together. But we need to be proactive on these actions to keep a step ahead and to make urbanisation sustainable. Uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Natano uh, wishes everyone a successful and productive event here today and looks forward to learning of the outcomes. He, he also hopes to meet, meet everyone in person at the six, soon at the, at the sixth Pacific Urban Forum. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Terry, for delivering that address on behalf of the Prime Minister. Uh, it's great to hear about the, the very strong leadership from Tuvalu. Um, so that's we, we are now formally opened and uh, our forum can now begin. Uh, firstly, we're going to just have a little bit of scene setting from a very hard working team of people who have been doing all of the work behind the scenes to make this event happen today. Uh, and so I'm going to invite um, um, Alex, whoops, I've lost my notes, try again. I now invite Mr. Alex Lee Emery, uh, Ms. Chatnam Lee and Ms. Sulky Huang to give us a, an overview of urban development progress in the region. And that will be the introduction then to hearing from country partners. Uh, and I just wanted to point out that um, Alex is operating from London. So it's, uh, it's past midnight, I think. So we just need to make allowances for that. So <laughs> over to you, over to the team. Thank you, Steve. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to the forum today. Now, thanks for joining. Um, I hope you can all hear me well. This section now is really going to be doing some of the scene setting um, and uh, bringing out some of the outcomes of uh, the regional work we've been doing, talking and uh, working with our country partners. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. So next slide, please. So first, what is the new Pacific New Urban Agenda? So the Pacific New Urban Agenda is a shared vision and framework to guide sustainable urban development in the Pacific. It was adopted at the fifth Pacific Urban Forum for five in 2019, and it calls on all actors at local, national and regional levels working to accelerate action across the four interconnected working pillars. It represents a, a localization to the Pacific region of the global new urban agenda. And uh, I'll just briefly talk through the different working pillars and what those seem to, to mean in practice. Urbanization, this essentially covers uh, anything to do with uh, informal settlements and basic services, uh, affordable housing, uh, gender equality and citizen engagement. Uh, the second working area, environment resilience and urbanization, relates to any efforts on climate change mitigation, community adaptation and infrastructure, as well as efforts towards ecological protection. Urban economy um, discusses uh, local economic development, including SMEs and uh, as well as tech. And then the final pillar uh, really brings the, the other three together, which is urban governance, which looks at um, policies, you know, national action plans and housing codes, for example, 
as well as uh, urban data, including the monitoring, data collection, and uh, architecture of that, whether it's centralized or not, as well as the empowerment of local governments. So next slide, please. To understand how we got here, I'll just uh, very briefly recap the, the Fifth Pacific Urban Forum, which uh, occurred in July 20 by uh, over 200 urban practitioners. And we were very lucky this was a, an in-person event and uh, include representation from 13 Pacific Island nations. And that really introduced the, the new urban agenda, as well as improving some of the mechanisms for data collection and knowledge sharing. Um, and the outcomes of that provide a contribution to into global and regional platforms, including Pacific Island Forum uh, Leaders Meeting, World Urban Forum, and uh, Asia Pacific Urban Forum. So there's a there's a link there, and we'll share the slides afterwards. You'll be able to explore those in more detail. Um, but next slide, please. So two years on from from per five, really, uh, when we were looking at, we saw two key drivers of change, and, and the world is, as as everyone knows, is a the fact that we're doing this virtually considerably different. So five months after the event, the first uh, cases of COVID-19 were detected and then eight months after the five, uh, a pandemic was declared. In relation to the impacts on the Pacific region, this really is uh, largely looking at the economic impacts. Um, and uh, we'll talk in more detail, but the three key areas are really looking at travel and tourism, uh, remittances, uh, imports and exports of goods. Um, the entire region and you know, very much uh, the wider Asia Pacific really had to implement new public health measures. And it's really shown how good governance and uh, preparedness are really key. Um, looking at the Pacific as a whole, vaccine access and distribution is uh, highly variable at the moment. And as we move towards the recovery stage, we'll need acceleration to make sure everyone gets the same level of protection. In terms of climate change, uh, looking at the recent sixth uh, assessment by the IPCC, uh, you can see there's really some, some clear and uh, scientifically robust evidence that the uh, disaster risk reduction and climate resilient infrastructure efforts really do need to be scaled up, um, particularly looking at uh, tropical cyclones as well as uh, heat extremes. And uh, climate migration especially and resettlement planning is uh, more important than ever, especially as we head into the upcoming COP26 event. So next slides. If we consider this looking from a, a sustainable development perspective, so this data from the SCAP 2020 SDG progress report, um, although we're seeing progress across some goals, the Pacific region as a whole is not on track to, to achieve the 17 SDGs by 2030. In terms of uh, where we're seeing progress, we've seen advances in health, uh, industry and innovation, sustainable cities and climate action, um, whereas there's really been some concern about regression across uh, SGG indicators related to uh, inequality, uh, sustainable consumption and production, as well as peace, justice and institutions. In terms of what we're interested in, particularly SDG 11, which is the sustainable cities and communities, um, the, the key indicator for future work here is really the resilience to disasters, which has seen regression. That said, looking at these, there's uh, persistent data limitations from across the region. Hi, um, we seem to have a bit of um, connectivity issue uh, with Alex's um, uh, Zoom, so um, I'm happy to take over um, the rest of the presentation. Um, so next slide, please. So um, very warm welcome to, to you all to the Virtual Pacific Urban Forum. It's, bit, um, it's lovely to see you all here and to reconvene after two years, um, where we'll be hearing from our country partners um, on any progress that they've been making towards um, sustainable urban development and their proof of commitments. And we'll also be hearing from um, our um, steering committee members uh, later on um, in the event about um, their work programs. So uh, next slide, please. 
So just to give a more general overview on um, COVID-19 and, and its impact on urban development, um, the impacts of COVID-19 are worth a seen worse hit in urban areas where um, about 95% of COVID-19 cases are found to be in urban areas and specifically in um, informal settlements where um, there's um, greater level of vulnerabilities posed by high population densities and very little open, um, open spaces, uh, as well as their limited access to um, basic services and shared facilities. Um, and um, there's also issues with access to health services, um, health services, um, uh, um, which is which is commonly seen in cities um, and um, in, in informal settlements. Um, there is also a lack of data and mapping um, um, for a lot of these informal settlements. As a result, um, it, it's a bit difficult to um, inform very timely responses um, for COVID-19. Um, so water and sanitation services are more important than ever um, to mitigate against COVID-19. And um, we are seeing an average of 93% improvement across the SIP um, um, in terms of drinking water access. However, there are still issues um, to do with supply consistency and um, access to um, piped facilities. Um, for um, clean water. So next slide, please. So to dive deeper into um, specific COVID-19 impacts and responses um, in Pacific cities, um, we are seeing um, across the region that um, the public health risks are um, generally um, well controlled for many of our Pacific countries. Um, however, many of cities um, in, in the region are suffering major economic losses, particularly in the tourism sector, um, which is a um, very key economic driver for the region and many Pacific cities. So um, we're seeing more than 80% of households reporting um, income losses since the onset of COVID-19. Um, as a result of unemployment, there's also been delays in remittances um, from overseas, especially from um, those who are employed overseas. And um, we are also seeing imports and exports disruptions, which um, resulted in a, a surge in food prices and um, affecting the affordability of food and um, ultimately food security. So some of the key responses that we're seeing um, include border closure to um, contain um, the pandemic and uh, many um, states have issued states of emergency decrees and um, uh, there had been a, um, more public communications and campaigns to raise awareness on um, COVID-19 and, and social distancing measures, as well as um, more data collection to keep track of daily cases and to um, contact trace cases, um, as well as profiling of informal settlements to see how um, um, timely responses can be um, can be implemented. And um, we're seeing more investment in public health, um, uh, as well as um, and more specifically in medical equipment and quarantine facilities in many of these cities. And lastly, um, a lot of um, um, emergency financial supports have been rolled out, um, including food banks um, and um, business supports for SMEs. Next slide, please. So um, to look um, more specifically into the trends and challenges to deal with the four working pillars of the Pacific New Urban Agenda, um, firstly, we have the social equity and urbanization pillar. And um, within this pillar, we're seeing um, more and more regional informal settlements upgrading programs being rolled out. So, um, for example, we've got the um, participatory slum upgrading programs, which are taking place in a lot of our Pacific cities to um, upgrade and um, improve slum um, informal settlements living conditions. And um, we're seeing more effort into promotion of gender equality and um, some more effort into <clears throat> promoting about the gen um, about gender based violence and prevention of it, um, as well as some affordable housing programs and um, targeting accessibility and offering support to first time buyers in the region. Um, however, um, challenges still remain within this pillar. Um, so um, despite efforts into um, promoting about gender violence, um, we're still, um, this is an area that still needs um, more work on, um, as well as um, unemployment in the region caused by economic instability and um, increased um, crime rates. And um, so um, household poverty is also a um, challenge um, within the region, um, where um, which affects food security and um, children's access to education. And lastly, um, there needs to be more planning for climate migration as well as social security. 
Next slide, please. So within the second pillar of the Pacific New Urban Agenda, environment, resilience and infrastructure, um, we're seeing um, the development of resettlement policy plans being rolled out in many um, Pacific cities, um, as well as an increase in public investment in climate resilient infrastructure, which is a much needed um, investment in the region. Um, there's also been more effort in, put into um, developing um, connectivity, both in terms of road infrastructure and um, telecommunications, such as broadband and fiber optics and um, we are seeing more in um, emerging urban environmental projects such as city beautification and public realm um, improvement um, projects happening in cities and um, yet some of the challenges we're still facing in the region include um, rise in sea level and um, um, and urban flooding um, as a result of um, climate change and um, the increased frequency of um, uh, extreme weather events such as cyclones and um, so disaster risk reduction remains as a priority in the region and this includes the rolling out of retro retrofitting and adaptation of existing infrastructure and um, um, uh, there's also um, more effort needed in um, the waste processing um, um, waste processing technologies in the region to um, address the um, very limited landfilling um, capacities in a lot of Pacific cities. So um, I will now be handing over to my colleague Silky, who will be taking you through the rest of the region over here. You have the floor, Silky. Thank you, Chan Lam, for introducing COVID-19 situation in the Pacific and the first two pillars. Now I'm going to talk about pillar three and four, which are urban economy and urban governance. Despite the pandemic, cities are still the largest contributor to national economy in the Pacific oh. as urban economy no. activity no. in many um, Pacific countries no. represents over half of national GDP. Since a large proportion of women are working in the informal sector, countries are providing grants for women-led small and medium enterprises, as well as providing capacity building trainings to encourage female workers in their economic sector. However, um, due to social distancing restrictions, the capacity of city markets has been reduced, resulting in reduction of household income and impacting the ab ability of informal dwellers to buy food and other necessities. Even though the Pacific countries are trying to revive their economies, the lack of youth employment and training opportunities are one of the big challenges in terms of urban economy. Next slide, please. In terms of urban governance, um, several countries have already achieved the digitized digitalization of governance services to improve the delivery of information and municipal services to those that need it most. Um, also, the development of national and subnational urban and housing policies is ongoing in a few countries to create mechanisms for more effective stakeholder engagement. There have been efforts to improve land and citizen registry, aiming to reduce land conflicts and ensure a common understanding of borders and ownership. However, um, consistent and reliable socioeconomic and urban data collection remains a key priority as um, urban data sources are fragmented and lack strategic vision. Next slide, please. So um, this slide shows the recommended, recommended policy priorities for countries to go forward. Um, firstly, under the first pillar, um, countries will need to prioritize informal settlements and affordable housing when um, preparing a national policy. And they also need to continue to support COVID-19 emergency plans. It is of vital to promote gender equality and to plan for migration and mobility brought by climate change. Under the second pillar, countries may consider investment in climate adaptation and resilience, as well as investment in connectivity, electrification to minimize the digital divide. There's also a call for urban waste management plan. Under the third pillar, it is recommended that countries support SMEs and innovative 
businesses. Um, COVID-19 economic support, especially retraining of people who have been involved in tourism sector, is urgently needed. Furthermore, countries may need to incorporate green growth in their economic recovery um, plans. Under the last pillar, it is imperative that countries ensure greater data collection and centralization and develop national urban policies. Cross-ministry and cross-sector collaboration will enable countries to foster sustainable urbanization. Next slide, please. Um, for more resources, you can visit Solevaka Community of Practice, which is a Pacific online knowledge and engagement platform where you can find all, your, all our inter, um, partnership resources and reports. Please also note that the regional progress report, which is consisted of two steps, executive summary and full report, will be shared with participants shortly after this event. There will be a post-event case study survey as well to hear your feedback on the event and to receive any additional resources about your case studies. Um, thank you for listening to our original overview today and we hope this session was helpful to you. If you would like to find more detailed information, please refer to the UN Habitats reports and assessment. Thank you. Over to you, Steve. Okay, thank you very much, Silky. Are we, are we back? Yes, we are. Uh, and thank you, Chapman, for taking over so quickly from Alex, whose um, connectivity dropped out. Uh, so we're going to move on now to what is probably the most central part of today's forum, and that's hearing from our country representatives. Uh, and look, we know that there probably will be some connectivity issues. Uh, we've just experienced that with London, so we can well expect to maybe have similar um, issues around the islands, but we'll do our best. Uh, Alexi and Kate at the University of Melbourne are running the platform from the back room, uh, and they'll do their best to keep things flowing. In general, uh, we'll be, uh, we will be showing the slides for the country speakers, so country speakers, you don't need to activate the slides yourself. Um, I, I'd just like to remind the speakers, we do have quite a few country representatives ready to speak that uh, just five or six minutes each, please. Uh, we've had a very good overview of the, the trends and the challenges uh, for sustainable development in the Pacific, and now we're very keen to hear what are the particular targets that you've set and what's the progress you're making in your country. Uh, and we're going to start off with um, the Solomon Islands. Now, I'm not too sure whether we've got Mr. Stanley Wallanesia, the Permanent Secretary, but our backup is um, Budley, and I think we're probably going to go across to Budley. So let's, let's see how we go. This, is, this will be the Solomon Islands. Yeah, hello. Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, it's still morning here in the Solomon. A very warm welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Stanley. I'm the permanent secretary for Ministry of Lunch and Housing. Uh, yeah, we, I'm from Malaita province and specifically from Lang Lang Lagoon, one of the uh, famous uh, lagoons here in, in the Solomons. Um, yeah, we eventually connected uh, from Honiara, the capital. Uh, today, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity afforded to me by my team. Uh, we have a uh, a team here, I'm surrounded by my team, and uh, I'm happy that they are here to give me the confidence. So I, I thank them for this opportunity. Uh, slide, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, on uh, country summary and population, um, Solomon Island, we are now more than 700,000 people. Uh, this is just over a quarter of population. Uh, we live in urban areas, including Honiara, and the urban population has been growing at 5.8% uh, per annum. Yeah, Honiara's population specifically is around um, 130,000 uh, people, 
this is uh, an increase from 2009 to 2019, about 78% increase. On uh, some of the key policies, um, this includes uh, the na national legislation, such as the Planning and uh, Development Act. Um, we also have uh, provincial and local, pol local policies. And the local planning schemes, especially for uh, Honiara, um, Henderson local planning scheme, and also uh, we we have on the policy side of things the climate change, uh, population and youth. On the governing bodies, Ministry of Lands Housing has a key role to play in managing urbanization and. Uh, climate resilience. We do, as always, collaborate with other ministries of the government in this field, as well as uh, the Honiara City Council, the provincial governments, and non government organizations. Uh, on some of the key trends, uh, it includes uh, rapid increasing urban population, we are experiencing that, and uh, continued reduction of uh, urban green space, as well, as well as tree cover in Honiara. Our challenges, our challenges, our challenges include the impact of climate change, just like uh, many other uh, Pacific countries, and environment degradation, as well as economic and housing constraint. On COVID-19 um, impacts, yeah, we have uh, indirect economic impacts. We are so lucky, by God's grace, there is no community transmission, uh, but we uh, were adversely affected by, uh, in terms of economic, um, we have uh, cash flow problems. We experience uh, uh, unemployment as well. There was a state of uh, emergency. The government responded to the COVID-19 uh, situation. So there was a state of emergency legislation and also followed by uh, stimulus package and other government uh, support. This coming um, Sunday, we'll have our second lockdown, starting 6 p.m. And then we'll uh, resume uh, normalcy 6 a.m. on Tuesday. Next slide. On uh, the four thematic areas, the pillars. Uh, excuse me, Badley, you'll need to move through this slide fairly quickly, please. Since the Pacific Urban Forum in uh, 2019, Soma Island has continued to make progress. Um, in terms of social equity, there are three major housing projects, the national housing policy, land registration, uh, public service rental scheme, and um, yeah, continuous conversion of TOL to fix them. On uh, the urban economy pillar, work is underway to develop planning schemes in other provinces. Henderson is one of them. Uh, last week, the minister uh, approved it and it was gasseted. Now on the uh, environment resilience, infrastructure and urbanization, UN Women held a gender forum to support action across provinces on disaster. Also uh, under that uh, Pillar, climate change resettlement policy has been prepared and uh, hopefully will be uh, presented to the cabinet before the end of this year. Finally, on the urban governance uh, pillar, we have a draft national urban policy already endorsed by the cabinet. 
We are currently working on reclassifying perihelion areas with aerial data. UNDP is also supporting the ministry and the government in terms of land, customary land recording. The Greater Honiara Urban Development Plan is also an important area which will be resubmitted to uh, the Prime, Prime Minister's office. Slide more, please. Next slide. Uh, on climate uh, resilient Honiara, now I would like to briefly touch on the uh, project been implemented by UN Habitat with funding from the Adaptation Fund. The project focused on improving climate change and disaster resilience in Honiara. UN Habitat also support a range of climate interventions such as wash facilities, drainage, flood protection, evacuation center, and also community capacity building. The project is being implemented in partnership with the Honiara City Council and the Ministry of Environment, as well as RMIT University, providing scientific and technical support for the project. Yeah, the, pro the project is now heading into implementation phase, which will involve engineering intervention, urban greening, organic farming, as well as supporting development of habitat for humanity sh shelter guide. For more information on this uh, project, you can, uh, uh, Google Climate Resilient on your Facebook. Next slide. Yeah, that's the, the last one. Thank you so much for your attention, uh, all of you out there. Um, it's uh, a very challenging time, I know, but thank you uh, for listening to our country update. Over to you. Alexi or whoever is on the other side. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It's Steve here, and I owe you an apology because you are Stanley Valenicia, the uh, secretary. Uh, we thought it was Buddley speaking on your behalf. So thank you very much for that, Stanley. Uh, and certainly uh, our organisation, ICLEI, has been very pleased to be a part of the Climate Resilient Honiara program too. Uh, we do need to move on fairly quickly. So it's my great pleasure now to introduce Ms. Lotatasi Morakao who is the Deputy Secretary of the Ministry of Local Government and Agriculture uh, on behalf of the Tuvalu Government. So over to you, Ms. Morikawa. I believe you're still muted. Uh, we can hear you, thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, a very good morning to you all from Tuvalu. Next slide, please. Hello? Yes, we're hearing you loud and clear. Thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much. With our uh, urban uh, population, we have uh, 6,320 people here in Tuvalu, uh, according to our 2017 uh, census. With our key urban policies, uh, Tuvalu has just completed its National Strategic Sustainable Development Plan, known as the Kete, 2021 to 2030, and uh, urbanization is reflected in all five uh, strategic priority areas. Each island in Tuvalu have their own island strategic plans with a lifespan of 2021 to 2024, and in their island uh, strategic plans, or ISBs, 
uh, urbanization or internal migration is another major uh, topic in which they, they really are, are concerned with. Our governing bodies is the government of Tuvalu, uh, including all line ministries concerned, even with uh, partners from the private sector and CSO. Our trends, as I have mentioned before, according to the 2017 census uh, report, internal uh, migration is really high. Uh, in 2017, where Sunafuti population is about 60.2% compared to 2012, where the population on Sunafuti is around 51.1%. And therefore, uh, Sunafuti is dominating with all age groups residing in terms of the counts and with, with the exception of elderly people. Better opportunities, as we all know, and better services including employment opportunities and health facilities is another major factor to the trends. Our challenges, overcrowding is our other major uh, challenge in Tuvalu in regards with housing on the capital now. It's a very major challenge and also water and sanitation given inadequate water supplies and sanitation services in Sunasuti, the capital. With COVID-19 uh, impacts, uh, our borders have been locked down early in 2020, as you all know, and that is uh, one of the, uh, the government uh, incentives so that uh, we might uh, be safe from the COVID-19. And also our health services and uh, sea transport uh, have been uh, impacted by our borders are locked down and also borders locked down from other places, given uh, most of our food are imported. And that's why I mentioned senior transport. Our COVID-19 responses, that's our Aliki plan, which is the COVID-19 alert and responses plan, uh, have uh, four levels, have four different levels in it. And also levels have uh, major uh, activities in which the, the, the chair, who is the prime minister himself, the honorable prime minister Nathan, who is the chair for the COVID-19 task force, and all our uh, secretaries and members from CSO and the private sectors, and also local councils are all included in this uh, task force. And they have uh, a very good uh, Response to all the, the plans which have been reflected in the Talaliki plan. Even our for our responses, uh, even though we have a, a close, we have border closure, otherwise we still need our development partners our responses in terms of our, our health uh, facilities and equipment. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide is there. Uh, it is just a bit of a delay from your end in seeing it, I think. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. We have completed our this was annual review for our Tuval Integrated Rest Policy, which is very good progress. And also the government has uh, added on to we had already have one acre, but the government had already added on another half acre to all of our islands so that uh, we may have uh, agricultural development on those uh, uh, half acres and will be leased by the government. We also have a healthy uh, local uh, strategy food uh, supply uh, strategic plan, which have been uh, implemented and uh, will be executed by the Ministry of Finance. In regard with our urban economy, we have outsourced some of our cleaners and security to the private sector and will be uh, in place like in October. Uh, provisions of loans to local farmers. Uh, we have uh, submitted a proposal to this act in, in regards with, the, with our uh, with, uh, with funds so that we can uh, give it to our local farmers in order for them to have uh, produce more products. In regards with our environment's resilient infrastructure and in urbanization, application of and management of ESIAs has been in progress now with our airfields on six islands in the outer islands and the usable of land after completion of the borough pit, which is a project in New Zealand. 
there are many houses on it now, so it is it is really good. Uh, building of harbour facilities in Tiaus Island is another major project and has been uh, very good in progress. One of the island nearly finished or completed their harbour. And now our TZIP, which is the Tuvalu Priority Infrastructure Investment Plan, have all the, the, the projects from line ministries in it and uh, supported uh, and, and has also endorsed by the, by, by, by the cabinet. Formulation of our advisory ability committee and also the steering committee for national infrastructure has been well progressed and supported by our cabinet really well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, we're seeing it uh -huh. in sanitation. Yep. Can you? Okay, thank you. Next slide. Uh, we're seeing the slide on preparing the Funafuti water and sanitation. Is that the one you wanted? Yes, please. Yeah, we can see uh, that. that is the one of our well, that is one of our major uh, progress in one of our projects. But due to COVID nineteen, uh, it has been uh, uh, panned for some times because of border closures and other <clears throat> and other issues. However, the project aims at uh, reducing the vulnerability to climate hazard in investment and invest in adequate water and sanitation services. Uh, we uh, we have, uh, as you may all know, we have uh, uh, challenges with our sources of water. It, it, it on, on the capital, it is frequent. So this project is really important to us and also to islands too. Uh, with our, our next steps, there will be a feasibility study has been provided to design the approach and principles for the designing of the project and uh, the, the PRF and the Ministry of Finance is the executing, executing and implementing our agency for this uh, project. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Marakao, we can, we can see the thank you slide and um, we thank you for the time. Uh, and I think thank everyone, you very much. I think everyone, everyone listening is very aware of the challenges for such a small country to be uh, driving such a very big program. So congratulations. We, we now move on to uh, Vanuatu and it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Jeffrey Katip, who's the Acting Director for the Department of Urban Affairs to present on behalf of the Republic of Vanuatu. So over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you, uh, Steve. Um, hi, everyone. Next slide, please. Okay, the, the urban population is 22.4% uh, of the total population, which is 301,695. And uh, this is from the 2020 uh, population and uh, housing census. And the key urban uh, policy here is uh, we have a national sustainable development plan uh, 2016 to 2030, which is uh, on the other hand, we also call as uh, the people's plan. It outlines all the policies and also the key uh, policy objectives for the uh, uh, in, relate, in, in relation to the urban uh, policies. And also, the other policy that is under development is the national urban policy. The, gov the governing body says we have uh, national gov uh, we have three levels of uh, three tiers of uh, governance. We have national uh, local government councils, which is six. And we have uh, three municipal councils, and we have uh, 72 area councils throughout the country. The trend here is um, we had an increase in uh, rural urban migrations. People from the outer islands tend to move to 
the two uh, adventure or the three adventures which is uh, Luconville and Port Phila, uh, and Lenakel uh, Township as well. And we also had an uh, increase in the number of uh, urban squatters in the, the, especially the two main centers of Portville and Luganville. And we also experiencing um, a lot of uh, portions of land or hectares of land being uh, acquired by the, the, the foreign investors. The challenges here is uh, the, the, we have uh, experienced a lot of uh, urban employment. Uh, and also the other one is no systematic approach to regulate housing price. We have uh, a lot of housing in the market, but uh, there is no regulations to, to control the price. And also we have lack of affordability, uh, affordable, uh, suitable land uh, for, for subdivisions and also for the government to, to really run the subdivision program. Uh, so far, we only have uh, national housing corporations, but apart from that, there is no uh, subdiv subdivision program for the government. COVID-19 index, we have uh, tourism is, uh, remains uh, severely impacted as uh, being an uh, economic driving force of Vanuatu. And currently, a lot of uh, our residents from the who uh, who are in overseas continue to repatriate from uh, uh, government continue to repatriate them from the overseas to to Vanuatu. And also to date, we have no confirmed case of COVID-19 in Vanuatu. Uh, the responses that government uh, responds to COVID-19 is uh, we have a task force and the, the leadership of the national housing uh, national disaster management is the uh, takes uh, lead on the overall coordination of the COVID-19 operations where the health cluster leads the medical aspects of the operations. Uh, to date, we also have a state of emergency is still uh, currently ongoing with uh, directives uh, pending the state of emergency regulations and the latest Council of Ministers decision on the stimulus package. Next slide, please. On the four pillars or thematic areas, uh, the social equity and liberation here, we have uh, our subdivision policy just recently launched by the Ministry of uh, Lands and Natural Resources. And also uh, we have a National Housing Corporation as a standard statutory body way to mandate to execute, it, execute the government policy on housing. Apart from that, we, uh, we also uh, create positions within the new Department of Urban Affairs. Uh, there's a position of housing officer to also work in uh, collaborations with the, 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 the International Housing Corporation as well, uh, especially on the policy. Uh, under the urban, uh, urban economic, we have uh, pandemic urban uh, economic uh, response plan that the central government by issuing stimulus packages to help uh, uh, small uh, medium enterprise and also the small uh, locally owned uh, businesses. That uh, also addressed the, the women engaged, women engaged men in small business through roadside markets and selling handicrafts. We, the government is also engaged uh, a public pri private partnership with a government subsidy of uh, 70 days and 60 40s as uh, one of the, the main priorities of uh, budget for this year, 2021, especially on the agriculture and fisheries sectors to encourage uh, innovative entrepreneurs for locals who wish to start small business. Environment, the environment in resilience, infrastructure and urbanization. The, the government or the Vanuatu also experienced a lot of uh, this, uh, disasters. We have a recent uh, evacuations from the island of Empire, and also government is addressing displacement policy to fulfill an obligations of the Vanuatu climate change and disaster risk reduction policy by providing holistic approach. Uh, 
on that note, we also, under the Ministry of Climate Change, uh, through the Disaster Management Office, we also conduct uh, awareness, uh, educational awareness programs uh, to before climate change and disaster preparedness to all levels in uh, as uh, in old schools as a medium uh, way of disseminating information. Under the urban governance, we do have a new dedicated Department of Urban Affairs and planning uh, recently launched, mandate to deliver a range of basic urban service. Next to that is uh, we continue to uh, to legislative review and amendment of municipal Act, uh, fiscal planning act, also act, and also national uh, urban policy, which is under uh, development. Next slide. Uh, I've, I've mentioned about the new newly launched Department of Urban Affairs and Planning. Uh, our mission here is to achieve sustainable stable, sustainable, and prosperous urban and foso development in Vanuatu. Our mission here is to develop conducive policies, legislations, planning frameworks, and promote administrative and technical support for the development and growth of urban and foso development that achieves vibrant, inclusive, resilience, adaptive, and high quality service and environment for all. Uh, the, the result here is uh, on your on your right uh, in front of your screen. You can see the Honorable Deputy Prime Minister and at the same time the Minister of Internal Affairs with the uh, launch the, the the department and also uh, with our partners. We have uh, uh, New Zealand government and also uh, Australian government as well and other ministers also in the far uh, right on your uh, the screens. We also have a uh, newly procurement uh, new department figures that uh, the minister concerned upon the, to the uh, department. And uh, another project next step here is uh, we continue to recruit uh, new officers to the new department. And the other one is uh, hopefully we will launch uh, uh, the website for the, the, the new new department uh, fully next month, uh, September. Uh, next slide. I think this is the end. And um, thank you, Thomas, for your listening. And uh, see you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey. Very interesting presentation. We can see the pressure that uh, rural to urban um, migration is putting on the towns and the cities in the Pacific. And uh, great to see the establishment of the new Department of Urban and um, Urban Affairs. So congratulations on that. Uh, we now move to, um, where are we going? To the Cook Islands. Uh, we're going to hear from the Director of Island Governance from the Office of the Prime Minister, Ms., uh, Mr. Mia Teorima. Um, and I think, um, Mr. Teorima is with us, so I'm, I'm handing across now. Just wait for a moment until we make the connection. Here we go. Thank you, Rana Steve. Thank you, Rana O from the Cook Islands. How are you? All very well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve, and thank you, everyone, for, for, this, uh, for, for this opportunity. And can we have the first slide, please? Thank you. Yep, and um, uh, that's the population that I've got there is just for Rarotonga, which in this, in the context of our discussion, I would say this is our urban, urban area where, where our people uh, come from the Paino, I call it the Paino of the Outer Islands. Uh, there's 15 islands in the Cook Islands, by the way. And uh, people moved to the Kuka, to Rarotonga for you know for medical education reasons and so forth. And then from here they move on to New Zealand and Australia or other parts of the world. So and that census is as as at um, 2016 December 2016. Look, the the, the presentation that I have, I, I tried to be uh, to be brief. Um, just to keep um, to, to keep the discussion within the time frame. 
Um, key urban policies, of course, our overarching, national overarching policy is our NSDV, um, which, is, um, which is currently under review and we have a new one coming up. Um, I think in a month or two months time, it will be, it will be uh, launching. That's the NSDA uh, 2020 plus National Sustainable Development Agenda. And one of the recent ones that we had is to do with the ETS, Economic Development Strategy, and that's um, one that's been developed in response uh, to COVID-19. CSDP is the overarching strategy direction or plan of the Alzheimer's Biennial. And um, two other policies that we have are water, based on water policy, and climate change policy, and there are others um, that um, that didn't come on the list. Um, governing bodies, and uh, this um, uh, this include the Office of the Prime Minister, o OPM, uh, Ministry of Finance and Economic Management. Uh, CSDP is governed by Island Government's Ministry of Health, partly to do with water. Um, Climate change is also mandated um, or managed by OPM. I think as a um, common um, trend for us as well is the immigration. Um, there is continuous um, movement of people um, migrating uh, from the Pioneer or from the Outer Islands to Rotor and overseas. Um, I mean, um, we have uh, free access, free visas to, to New Zealand and um, and Australia, uh, which doesn't uh, help in this context, but uh, that's what it is. And then now uh, we have high cost, high cost of living, uh, especially in in the uh, in the Pioneer. Uh, for challenges, we have labour shortage um, uh, challenges um, due to continuous immigration, and um, there's sort of like uh, an exchange in the in the labour uh, force. Uh, whereby we have um, um, foreign workers, uh, especially coming into the hospitality or tourism industry. And of course, climate change continues to, and will continue, I suppose, to be a challenge to, uh, to us here in the Cook Islands, um, particularly on Rabotong. COVID-19 impacts, of course, loss of employment, um, because we are heavily dependent on our tourism, so there has been a lot of um, unemployment um, or partly unemployed um, people as a result of uh, COVID-19. Um, and then as a result of that, our government has to uh, come up with, um, you know, uh, packages, financial packages to support uh, these um, uh, these these unemployed or partly unemployed people, uh, which is part of the responses, and that is um, there were subsidies. Um, our people were lucky that um, our government uh, were, was able to provide uh, subsidies during this time. Um, one of the responses, of course, we we I would say we are up to ninety eight percent fully vaccinated in our national population. Uh, which is which is good, and that um, that's for both uh, doses. Can I have the next slide, please? All right. Um, social equity and urbanisation. Um, our national government has continues to support our our people, and two of the supports that has uh, impacted on our people socially is the, the waiver of our energy tariff and also the uh, uh, interest payment um, on, um, on, uh, on loans with, uh, with the banks. And um, as, a, as a result of uh, COVID-19 as well, we, you know, we have to come up with um, uh, with um, new ways of of employing or um, getting employment opportunities, communicating uh, employment opportunities to to our people, and um, 
our Ministry of Internal Affairs uh, was able to do that, and uh, that was very, um, very, um, very good because um, um, they were able, government were then able to take on a lot of these unemployed people uh, during, you know, during last year up to now, and some of them uh, have decided to stay in the public sector as a result of you know, of these uh, initiatives that our Ministry of Internal Affairs came up with. In terms of urban economy, um, again, our national government uh, provides stimulus financial packages, um, especially around uh, innovative businesses, um, ICT uh, in initiatives, um, and agriculture um, programs. So, um, um, the, feed, the feedback has been very positive, uh, so people have been um, have been taking advantage of this support from our national government. Uh, again, increase in online business activities as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, classic example of this is, um, I think, is one of our agencies that's um, that's responsible for our foreign investment. And one of their tasks is to support our small to medium enterprises. So um, they were able to come up with um, with ways of marketing uh, the Pioneer or the Outer Islands um, uh, products, crafts like crafts and so forth, or even uh, vegetables to the Rotorua market um, through uh, through uh, their own website as well as uh, Facebook. So again, um, the response to this has been fantastic. Environment, um, resilience, infrastructure and urbanization. Uh, what I've got there is strengthening of key infrastructure projects such as roads and bridges. Again, the government um, continues to invest heavily in uh, key infrastructures um, on the main island of Rautonga. Um, and also increased in the climate change resilience and adaptation programs through non-government organizations. What did I say there? Yeah, and um, you know, um, we, we continue to strive for 100% renewable energy. Um, we still have um, Rautan and Aichutaki to be um, uh, to be fully um, um, installed with renewable energy, uh, but uh, we continue to work on that. In terms of urban governance, CSDP, as I said earlier on, this is our island government um, overarching strategy plans. Um, I'd like to to see uh, this plan to, you know, to have an integration of or emphasis on um, on uh, retention of population. On, on each island out there. So the new, we are currently reviewing and consulting on the new one, on the new CSTP. Hopefully by the end of the year, that will be completed. Um, updated um, infrastructure act last year that was, um, that was uh, done and mainly to improve the provision of services, access to properties uh, and so forth. Um, likewise, with our National Environment Act, the same, um, the same rationale to give our National Environment Services uh, Agency to have more, um, more power to access to properties and implement the uh, services. Next slide, please. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah. Okay, so that's just a sample of the infrastructure. So again, uh, this is just one of the projects that I I, I picked up um, because it's very uh, key on on Rautong and um, and I said earlier on uh, the results um, of this of this project is improved, you know our, our waterways, uh, reducing the impact of flooding around town, safe roads. And also, it provides um, continues to provide employment opportunities for for our people. Uh, so this is very key to, of course, to any economy. But uh, for us, since we have free access to to New Zealand, we really need to work hard on this. Um, I'm not sure whether you guys have heard that we 
you know, some of our youth has been um, poached. Well, I shouldn't say poached, but um, uh, has traveled to, to New Zealand to um, to 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 work uh, what they call the seasonal uh, workers in the audits and the freezing work. So, um, uh, unfortunately, there's nothing much we can do. But um, you know, they need employment. But these are some of the initiatives, the key projects that we 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 have to come up with. Uh, to keep our, our people over here. So uh, next steps, as I said, these are ongoing projects, especially which islands are, are being targeted uh, for, for likewise um, infrastructure projects in the outer islands. So, um, you know, we look forward to continue doing that. And, um, and uh, we, our government is uh, doing well in uh, responding to the impact of climate change as well as um, COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I think that's about it. Um, Steve, thank you very much. And thank you guys for your attention. Terrific. Thank you, Mia. Very interesting presentation. I, I feel like I need to apologize to you coming from Australia that we're, that we're um, draining your <laughs> the emigration. So we've been hearing about rural to urban migration within the islands, but also, you know, migration from the islands to New Zealand and Australia is obviously a big pressure. Just a couple of um, housekeeping points for all the listeners. Uh, we will be sharing the, all of the presentations after this event and also a summary report, uh, because I think we all agree there's a lot of very rich information here we'd like to go back into. Uh, and also a reminder, we've got the Q&A function here. So if you'd like to register questions for later in the session, please, please do that. Uh, now, our next speaker was to be from Papua New Guinea. Mr. Ted Lulu was going to be speaking, Executive Director um, from, for Research and Policy from the National Capital District Commission. However, unable to do that. So we, we, got, we had the slides. And uh, one of the team, I think Alex, is going to walk us through those slides on behalf of Papua New Guinea. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. So first, I'd just like to say, yeah, compare apologies from uh, Mr. Ted Lulu and uh, also Mr. Joe Warris and Larson Thomas from the Department of Provincial and Local Government Affairs, uh, but they've all worked really hard on, on the presentation. Um, so, yeah move on so focusing on port moresby which is the capital of uh, Papua new guinea it's the largest city in the south pacific outside of australia and new zealand uh, with a population of around 350,000. but that was a um, from a census back in 2011 so unofficial estimates are really looking at pushing that number above 1 million now in terms of uh, the key policies since uh, the last pacific government forum uh, they recently published a strategic urban development plan, um, the Port Moresby towards 2030, which really focuses on uh, urban infrastructure and also social services. Um, in terms of the, the key governing bodies, there's the, uh, the National Capital District Council, which is in charge of Port Moresby, but also uh, provincial and local government affairs, environment and conservation works and climate change departments. Regarding the, the trends facing uh, Port Moresby specifically, uh, they're really investing in some of uh, their road infrastructure in particular. So four lanes in uh, all the four key point entry points to the city, um, as well as uh, some new renewed focus on uh, environmental sustainability initiatives. So, you know, they have a tree planting program um, and settlement upgrade schemes. Um, in terms of the challenges, they've, uh, a lot of this infrastructure comes uh, along in, in areas where there are informal settlements. So negotiating that has uh, been you know, highlighted as a challenge, as well as um, issues of uh, crime which, uh, and law and order, which you know, relate somewhat to, to the unemployment that's ongoing. In terms of COVID, um, they did a great job of quantifying some of this impact. So 75% of small medium enterprises were severely impacted by the lockdowns as well as 35% uh, of households are reporting job losses from the survey. But they did have a, an interesting response with uh, the revitalization of provincial radio stations um, to achieve some of their communication strategy and uh, reach out to some of the, the more outlying settlements, um, as well as uh, investing in the health infrastructure and uh, implementation of the National Pandemic Act 2020. Next slide, please. 
In terms of the specific activities uh, regarding social equity and urbanisation, they recognise the need for action on gender equality and have recently formed uh, the Gender-Based Violence Parliamentary Committee to accelerate action on that, as well as in terms of affordable housing, the development of two and a half thousand allotments uh, just outside of Port Moresby in the Durham Farm Housing Project. Uh, they also have an ongoing project to register all children under the age of five um, through the Civil Identity Registry. Regarding the urban economy, they've created special economic zones uh, aiming to attract uh, foreign investments, some of these are particularly in and around Port Moresby, as well as a national digitisation policy, which uh, aims to target communications and technology. Um, as well as, uh, they've also uh, initiated a programme of digitisation of uh, land titles and registry through an online system. It's something which we've seen uh, several of our countries doing in uh, the last couple of years, and I think it's a really important step forward. In terms of environment, resilience and infrastructure, they're aiming to connect 70% of uh, all houses across the country um, to the grid by 2030 um, and to uh, continue this investment in you know, connectivity through uh, their Connect PNG programme, which really looks at road, air and maritime infrastructure. They're also cracking down on illegal logging and have plans to ban all logger exports by 2025. Finally, they're drafting the, the national housing policy, which is uh, in the time zone of 2021 to 2031, um, and have recently uh, implemented some government reforms to decentralise power and empower some of the local governments at provincial level. In addition, three city authorities have been established since 2019, um, and also district uh, audits were delivered to monitor the effectiveness of some of these reforms um, and really benchmark that, uh, their progress. So if we move to the case study, Papua New Guinea, they uh, are revitalizing their, their urban local government association. So this is a, a program which was initially established by 29 local governments um, with support from the CLGF Pacific Office and the Australian Local Government Association um, and was really used to you know, set up uh, sister city programs and uh, exchanges and knowledge sharing across uh, Australia internationally and also PNG domestically. Um, and, but however, due to funding and resource constraints over the last few years, it uh, sort of ceased to operate. Um, but now if we move to the next slide. This year, uh, in 2021, they aim to revive this programme and really bring together all the different local government associations together once more. Um, as well as, uh, and to do this, they've uh, used the Department of Provincial and Local Government Affairs, as well as the uh, National Capital District Council to provide some of these initial resources. And uh, they're really planning on scaling this up towards the end of the year at the Papua New Guinea National Urban Forum to be held in November, um, where they'll be you know, appointing the chairman and uh, executive body and secretariat. Um, and uh, at local level, this, they're looking to establish um, a council ward system as a, a form of community government in Port Moresby for early 2022. Um, additionally, they're doing some work on uh, data collection and monitoring through um, an online system called the, the Ward Record Book, which will be looking at urban socioeconomic data to help policymakers. So that's a, a very quick summary of Papua New Guinea. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you for um, reporting on behalf of, of Papua New Guinea. Uh, certainly speaking from behalf, on behalf of ICLI, which is a local government uh, membership association, and I'm sure the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, uh, we, we are both very keen to support the re-establishment of that um, local government association in PNG. Uh, moving on now, uh, we're, we're going to travel to Fiji. Uh, and we have Mr. Suruj Prasad, who's the Principal Policy Officer for Ministry of Housing and Community Development. So, uh, Mr. Prasad, over to you. Thank you, Steve. And uh, good afternoon from uh, Fiji. Uh, straight uh, going to the presentation. Uh, can we have the next slide? Uh, in terms of... Uh, in terms of uh, the uh, urban population, we have uh, over 490,000 
uh, urban population Fiji, which is about 55.9% uh, of the total population. And uh, in terms of our urban policies, we have actually a national, 20-year uh, national development plan, which governs the other policies and programs uh, undertaken by the ministry, uh, which are uh, uh, listed uh, on the slide. And uh, we have uh, uh, the Ministry of Housing and Community Development and uh, Housing Authority, Public Rental Board and other agencies that collaborate uh, to work together. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the COVID-19 impacts, uh, we have had an increasing trend of COVID-19 cases. Um, so far, we have a large number of active cases, uh, more than 19,000 active cases uh, as of 23rd of uh, August. And um, in terms of uh, uh, the impact on uh, businesses, there, there's about um, uh, Ninety-four percent uh, business have reported uh, adverse impact, together with uh, a decline in revenues uh, of business uh, income. Uh, about eighty-seven percent of businesses that were surveyed. In terms of our response, uh, COVID nineteen response operation, conducting awareness, uh, we have, uh, have government has been uh, uh, vigorously screening, uh, facilitating isolation and quarantine facilities for uh, infected uh, uh, people. Um, we had uh, been uh, uh, progressively lifting, uplifting our curfews. Uh, currently, we have uh, on VT level, we have a 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. curfew uh, daily, on a daily basis. Our businesses are opening uh, slowly uh, because we have, you know, um, increased our vaccination uh, plan and um, strict uh, measures. So, so far, uh, about 40% uh, of our population are fully vaccinated. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the progress uh, and achievements under social equity and organization, uh, uh, ministry has been uh, working on uh, informal settlement upgrade program. Uh, and the, the uh, participatory slum upgrade program and uh, in collaboration with the UN Habitat. And uh, a other number of uh, our programs are being uh, uh, which are listed on the slide are being reviewed to adjust the current needs uh, from the public and uh, we're working in collaboration with the uh, other two uh, agencies the housing authority of fiji and public rental board in addressing uh, some of these uh, um, uh, issues and challenges. In terms of the urban economy, our engagement uh, continues with the key stakeholders, such as the Ministry of Lands, Ministry of Economy, Rural and Maritime Development, and uh, Office of the Solicitor General. Uh, most of our uh, services uh, have shifted uh, towards online in virtual platform, uh, our customers, including our customer service uh, and uh, complaints. Um, our land leases uh, are facilitated through Ministry of Lands uh, for state land and, uh, and native uh, uh, lease lands for, through the to the ETH of KFAS board. In terms of uh, environment resilience, infrastructure, and organization, we have uh, a FRIS uh, uh, program. Again, we collaborate uh, with the UN Habitat on this, uh, this uh, program. We have a uh, uh, rural and maritime category four cyclone resilient house plants uh, available, as well as category five 
two bedroom and three bedroom house plans and these plans are available free of charge to the public it can be also downloaded or from the ministry's website and uh, Fiji's update uh, updated and this is uh, also including the multi hazard risk assessment uh, and uh, strengthening the housing stock uh, where we again work with uh, the uh, housing authority of Fiji on this uh, including the uh, IFC and other development partners uh, in terms of our urban governance uh, we are currently reviewing our national housing policy and this this also includes provision for informal uh, settlement upgrading um ministry holds a development lease of 46 uh, informal settlements where we upgrade an informal settlement to basic uh, standard and issue a 99 year uh, lease titles and uh, in progress uh, of capturing data for informal settlements has been an ongoing uh, uh, activity uh, for the uh, ministry uh, next slide please in terms of uh, one one of our important project that we work in pgs had alluded to earlier is uh, our fris uh, program uh, where we work uh, in collaboration with UN habitat and uh, implementing this project uh, because uh, this program makes a lot of impact on uh, on one of the most pressing issues in formal settlements and uh, impacting over uh, over 8000 uh, people and uh, to be able to address issues um, that are highly vulnerable to climate change and disaster risk where we have 16 informal settlements, uh, six are from uh, Lamy, uh, two from Singatoka, two from Mendy, and six Latoka. So uh, in terms of uh, the results, uh, there's been an increasing climate resilience of informal settlements. And then uh, we work uh, on uh, community, municipal, and uh, national level in terms of uh, vulnerability and risk assessment and targeted interventions. Uh, coordination of knowledge management and sharing as well as data collection and uh, mapping of informal settlements have be largely been uh, undertaken by the UN Habitat. And uh, in terms of uh, going forward uh, recently we have uh, uh, signed a agreement of cooperation which is extended until uh, 30 june 2022 where a large component of uh, this will be uh, in terms of upgrading of uh, or undertaking the capital of pro box program and uh, furthermore we are working with those uh, the three four uh, local uh, municipal councils uh, in Totoka, Singatoka, Nidhi, and Lemi, uh, where we have extended uh, the grant agreements with these councils to continue the service of uh, the resilience offices. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prasad. That was very interesting too. And we're hearing increasingly now that major, major issue in the larger island countries of informal settlements and all the work that's being done there to help to um, formalise them more and to help to reduce their extreme vulnerability. So thank you for that. Um, just a notice too, to the country speakers, if possible, we'd like you all to stay on for a minute when we move into the break fairly soon uh, so that we can take some um, family photos for our post-event publicity, if that's okay. So now we'd like to move on uh, to Kiribati, uh, just to find my place. 
Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to invite Ms. Uh, Regina Rotitake, who is Senior Urban Management Officer from the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And um, Regina will be presenting on behalf of the Republic of Kiribati. Thank you. Uh, I don't think we can hear you yet, Regina. Are you muted? <clears throat> That's better. Thank you. Um, good afternoon to you all from Kiribati. Um, next slide, please. Well, that's a, a brief introduction of Kiribati. Um, consisted of three island groups with 33 islands, which 21 islands are inhabited. Um, in terms of the urban population, and according to the 2015 census, there, there were around 110,000 people living in Kiribati, um, of which the two key urban centers on South Tarawa and Kirismas um, comprised and accounted to more than 50% um, of the total population. Um, the GI governing policies include, but not limited to the Kiribati National Urban Policy, the key for the Environment Policy and the General Land Use Plan. Um, while the urbanization is a cross-cutting issue, um, various sectors and partners have um, important roles to play in managing and addressing the urbanization. Um, however, some of these um, key agencies include the Ministry of Internal Affairs on implementing the urban policy, the Ministry of Environment, and the Ministry of Infrastructure, um, together with the three urban councils. Um, on COVID-19, Kiribati is one of the countries that has not recorded any COVID cases to date. And we acknowledge that this is one of our unique advantages of being remote and isolated from the rest of the world um, in distancing ourselves from this um, global pandemic. Um, however, despite um, being COVID-free, and like most of our Pacific um, brothers and sisters, uh, our borders are remain closed and preventive uh, measures are, are being implemented um, at the national level. The government, um, through the established um, COVID-19 task force, has developed the response plan and some of the pre patri and response measures conducted um, nationally includes um, the provision of stimulus um, packages, um, the government uh, initiative targeting those that are most likely affected by the um, financially by the COVID-19, and then the, the rollout of um, COVID-19 um, um, vaccines throughout South Tarawa. Um, next slide, please. On the BUF um, New Urban Agenda Progress and Achievements for the Social Equity Bill, um, Kiribati is now implementing the PSUP3 um, at two pilot um, communities on South Tarawa, um, where informal settlement analysis was conducted and upgrading strategy will be soon developed under the program. On planning, planning Plan time planning, we have a new and revised a police policy where no one is left in the application process. Um, everyone can access to. Also, there's a plan on urban renewal in some areas of Peso, where duplex houses will be constructed um, to accommodate squatter, live, um, squatter settlements um, and squatter um, dwellers living in those areas. And then the, the relocation plan for the squatters um, to the line islands. Um, we also have support funds for the unemployed, um, senior citizens and disabilities that was provided by the, the government. Um, also the, the livelihood and resilience as well as the disaster funds um, also provided and can access um, um, to everyone. On the urban economy, the government um, through urban task force um, has plans to develop commercial areas in Peso and Pairi, 
um, as well as um, advancing the implementation of detailed um, land use plan that was provided by the land department. And on strengthening the informal and small scale business, the, the government through the Ministry of Commerce, um, together with uh, loan institutions, um, offered loan schemes um, targeting unemployed youth uh, to start small scale businesses and also mobilizing of um, nationals to work overseas in the various um, lab labor schemes. Next slide, please. On the, the third pillar on environment, um, resilience and infrastructure, um, achievements so far include the phase two of the housing developments on South Tara through the Kiribati Housing Corporation. The project is expected to start in January 2022. And also we have the South Tarawa um, water supply and water distillation project um, to improve water uh, distribution to all levels of society. Uh, we also have um, disaster recovery supports um, that are offered to local communities, um, households and individuals that are affected um, by the disaster. And then the coastal protection on coastal areas and the implementation of the KCHIP, um, the Kiribati Joint Implementation Plan, um, the government uh, climate change policy. On the urban governance, uh, there's a national urban policy that was approved um, last, last year, 2020, and it is a guiding document for the government towards sustainable urban development. Then we have the Urban Council's um, strate strategic plans that link and align well to the government um, develop development um, project and policies. Then the general land use plan and the Urban Task Force Committee that was established under the Office of the Citizens. Next slide, please. We have um, this project on solid um, waste management. And this is the second phase of the project and was implemented um, since to 2016. So the project um, focused on the three open councils and it, it is um, funded um, fully by the New Zealand government um, through the MFET under the Urban Development um, Program. Um, with a aim to improve um, solid waste and management at the three urban councils. The project um, results include the management of the, the three existing um, landfills, and then addressing the, the public um, littering, as well as improving the waste um, collection services, and to improve um, the, the cleanliness around Tarawa and Girismas. Um, the, the project is now in its um, wrap-up stage and the government um, together with the New Zealand are now working on designing the, the next phase or phase three of the project. Thank you. And that's the, the end of my presentation and I thank you all for listening. Mm. Thank you very much, Regina. And uh, very, <clears throat> very interesting that the case study you highlighted around solid waste management and we know that uh, ironically waste management <clears throat> seems to be a very important underpinning for sustainable development of our towns and cities uh, and that brings us to our very last country presentation uh, and we'll be hearing from mr robert goodwin who's the head of the fsm project management unit uh, robert will be presenting on behalf of the federated states of micronesia so over to you robert Thank you very much, um, Steve. Um, I think you forgot to say uh, last but not least. <laughs> so uh, anyway. Um, I, I was tempted, but I resisted. The <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much for um, <clears throat> allowing us, uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, um, to make a presentation at this meeting. So if I may jump right into it, um, could I have the next slide, please? 
Um, Federated States of Micronesia, we have a population here of about 105,000. Uh, Our urban population is not large, it's only about 23%. Um, about 24,000 people. Um, <clears throat> uh, the key urban policies, um, there's a lot of focus on strengthening uh, the delivery of urban uh, of, of basic services um, in particular, which are largely, I must say, um, concentrated in the urban areas, our hospitals, our schools, and so on, clinics, um, the commercial enterprises, they're heavily concentrated in urban areas. Um, we are, um, you know, taking measures to strengthen delivery of services and to enhance um, the resilience of our, of our um, in particular, our primary transportation network, our primary road network, um, because, as I said, the, um, the services and the economic activities are largely focused, in, are largely concentrated uh, in the urban areas and um, enhancing the resiliency of these linkages is critical to spreading the economic uh, development throughout the country. And also to improve, um, we also have a policy of improving the urban environment. Um, we have new programs um, to address climate change, building regulations, and energy efficiency in public uh, buildings. Governing bodies, we have a lot of governments here. Um, there's a national government um, where I am based. Um, then we have the state governments. There are four state governments. There are four states within the FSM. And we have, I would think, about 50 or 60 municipal governments um, including town councils responsible for the towns. And then in terms of services, um, we have um, both national and statewide uh, utility companies responsible for delivering um, the utility services, telecommunications, power, and water. Um, in terms of trends, um, yes, there, there's a continuing low growth in the urban, when I say urbanization, more the urban population, um, which is sort of, um, I would say, almost stagnant. And this is largely caused by the fact that even though there is migration from the outer islands uh, to the urban centers on the main islands, but it's balanced by a very high rate of out-migration uh, to the United States. Um, and including the, the nearby U.S. Uh, territory of Guam, uh, the state of Hawaii, and um, the mainland. There is con because of the fact that FSM citizens, as part of the freely associated states, um, they, have, they can immigrate to the, to, the, to the United States without any uh, restrictions. Um, there are declining economic opportunities. This is one of the impacts of, of, of COVID. And, um, but there, however, one positive trend is that because of the um, heavy focus on infrastructure and services, they are improving access and reliability of urban basic services in particular. Uh, the challenges that we are facing include um, addressing the economic and social uh, inequities. There are many, um, especially between <clears throat> um, household income that, re that, that is dependent um, on the public sector and um, household income that is, more, that is dependent on the private sector, meaning that there is a significant wage gap um, between public sector employees and the uh, private sector employees. Um, the, the other challenges that we, the, the other challenge that we face is the need to expand investments in climate resilient infrastructure. Um, climate change is becoming more and more uh, evident in terms of increasing incidences of flooding and so on. Um, there's also a need to expand investment in the housing and urban renewal. <clears throat> the housing stock um, I'm personally finding is, is, is very much declining in terms of, um, both in terms of quality and um, in terms of even the services available within the houses, um, like sanitation in particular, and um, water. And um, we also face with the challenge of expanding uh, social programs and um, economic um, opportunities. <clears throat> the COVID-19 impact, we're still um, very fortunate in the FSM. Uh, we're COVID free as we speak. Um, but however, this has come um, at, a, at a huge cost in terms of uh, significant reductions in uh, economic activity, um, especially activities relating uh, to the tourist sector in particular. Um, there has been a decline in, in, in government revenues, um, household income and employment all have shown significant decline. So even though we are COVID free, um, it is coming at a, at a significant cost. Uh, we remain COVID free largely because of uh, our borders are, I would say, are partially open. 
um, you know, but um, there are a lot of restrictions in terms of incoming travel and um, to some extent um, travel within uh, the country. Um, there is a slowdown in our development projects. Um, we have quite an active portfolio of development projects. There has been a significant slowdown, uh, largely because of the, the um, difficulty of um, securing you know, experts in terms of consultants, engineers, and so on. Higher costs of imported commodities, um, this is, a, is, of course, a problem due to higher transportation costs and the fact that we are heavily dependent on imports. Our response has been, um, we have, um, as a government, implemented and continue to implement a number of stimulus and social protection programs. Uh, we have a very aggressive, I would say, vaccination program. Uh, we receive vaccines, by the way, from the U.S., um, so we have no shortage. Um, our vaccination rate at last count, I believe, was about 59% of the adult, the eligible adult population, um, which is considered to be quite encouraging, and the vaccination program is continuing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, in terms of um, progress um, and achievements um, in, uh, so for social equity and um, urbanization, I mentioned about um, the need to integrate um, the disadvantaged communities into mainstream economic activities. The economic activities to not, right now are very much uh, focused on the um, urban areas. Um, while the disadvantaged communities, of course, are dispersed um, throughout the country and including on the outer islands. Um, there are efforts to um, stimulate economic, act, uh, economic projects um, that can uh, bring the, the um, disadvantaged communities into the mainstream economic activities. And um, the coconut processing plant in Chuk is, an idea, is, is one example where there's a, a, a fairly substantial plant now being under construction in the state of Chuk, which will process a large amount of coconuts um, into things like um, you know, coconut oil and even coconut juice and so on for export. Um, we're trying to, to progressively expand services, as we said, largely services are, uh, the services are too heavily concentrated in the urban areas. Um, to move them to, to the rural areas and the outer islands and services, meaning, for example, access to internet, access to water and sanitation, access to energy. Um, we have um, been establishing social protection programs to try to get community awareness and preparedness activities um, to uh, sort of disadvantaged um, households in terms of hygiene and so on, uh, building toilets and so on if necessary, uh, hand washing facilities, etc. For the urban economy, um, we have been able to mobilize um, funding from the World Bank uh, to improve the, uh, the primary road network throughout the country. And this, um, the, one of the key objectives is to strengthen the rural urban uh, linkages and, and um, ensure better, more sustainable access to services which I mentioned are heavily concentrated in the urban areas. Um, we have a, a fairly substantial uh, portfolio of projects to expand renewable energy, digital connectivity, and water. A loan program has recently been established to support women-headed okay. uh, business um, activities. Um, hello? Yes, um, I thought I heard uh, uh, someone. Um, and uh, social programs um, to mitigate the effects of the COVID-19 I mentioned um, to help the unemployed and the most vulnerable households. And there has been a fund established to address the tourism sector, um, mostly the hotels, the restaurants, and so on, that have been heavily hit um, by the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Recently, we have established a tax reform commission to try to expand the revenue base um, for, the, um, for the government. Um, environment and resilience and infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, launched in 2018, the first state of the environment report, um, which has been a landmark report documenting all the environmental issues um, that have now been reflected in the, in the programs uh, that we're implementing. Um, we have an, an FSM infrastructure development plan, 2016 to 2025, um, that has been on the implementation for the last few years. Uh, we have been able, to, it envisages, um, I would think about the about two to 200 projects um, in that plan with an investment of over 1 billion. We have been able to mobilize about half 
of that funding, about 500 uh, million so far, um, to implement um, the plan. And the plan is on the implementation as we speak. Um, their state level action plans have been in place since 2017 for disaster risk management and climate change. We've recently launched a project, and that's one of the projects we'll mention here, um, to develop an FSM building code. We are concerned about this, this standard of our buildings, and in particular, the buildings uh, in, the, um, in, the ur in, the ur in the urban areas, um, which, sorry. Uh, Robert, sorry, you'll need to wrap up in just a moment if you can. Yes, I, I realize that time is going. Um, but I think there's just one more slide. Um, uh, the, the, the building code uh, project, um, as I mentioned, will, will, be, um, will be one of the projects that I, I, I will present um, in, the, in the, I think it's the next slide. Urban governance, um, the ongoing reforms um, on the, um, the institutional uh, development of the utility companies in particular. We are trying to strengthen the role of the town councils and in particular in these social programs that we are now implementing. And um, we have adopted new approaches in terms of stakeholder participation, um, in particular in the, in the uh, infrastructure development projects um, that we're carrying out. Next slide, which I think is the last one. Yes, the, um, the preparation of the building code, I mentioned this is one of the key projects um, that we are implementing now, we have started. Um, it is mainly to address, we don't have a building code in the FSM. Many of our urban buildings, an example is the State Administrative Center in Ponipe, um, which is presented here. Uh, many of our urban buildings are in very, very bad state and continuing to deteriorate. Our housing stock is also in bad state. And we believe that improving the sort of enabling environment um, to address a fairly comprehensive program to improve uh, our both our housing stock and the commercial and institutional building, we're going to need this building code um, in order to get the standards and so on in areas such as um, energy efficiency, climate resilience, and so on. Last, very last slide. I just wanted to mention one other project, and this will just take another minute or two. Last slide, please. Yeah, this uh, the climate resilient road improvement project. I mentioned that um, we are trying to strengthen and ensure this, the uh, resilience of the primary road network, given that our services are heavily concentrated in the urban areas, while our population are dispersed um, throughout the country in, in, in settlements, both on the, the main islands and the outer islands. And um, this is a major program that we have just started with the World Bank with initial funding of 40 million. It's expected to grow to a program of about two or 300 million in the next couple of years. And um, it has just started, as I said, um, we are right now carrying out the vulnerability assessment and the preparation of a climate resilient road strategy, which will set the sort of priority investments um, to be carried out for this program. And um, the next steps, of course, is to complete it and uh, get the procurement started for the uh, consultants and contractors. I think that is it. And um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Robert. You've done very well. And in fact, I think this was a case of saving the best till last. So well oh. done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And good to see the focus on um, building codes and planning schemes and resilient infrastructure too. That really rounds out very nicely a lot of the um, challenges and, and ambitions that we've heard this morning. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we've done very well. We've had we've covered a huge amount of territory in a very short time. We are aware that there were several other countries we're not able to present this morning, such as Samoa, Marshall Islands, etc. But if there are any representatives from those countries here, um, we'd encourage you to join in the roundtable discussion, which will be in the second part of this program. So um, we're slightly behind our schedule, but we've finished the first big part of the program right on uh, what it would be 1pm or 11am um, in Melbourne time. So that's a good time to take a break. Now, we would ask all of the speakers so far, please, to stay online for a moment um, and to um, switch on your cameras so we can take a, a family family photo. Uh, Alexi, you might just want to step forward if you want to give any instructions on this. Uh, for the rest of the participants, please um, take a take a, a break uh, and we'll start again in 15 minutes, which would be at um, a quarter past one Fiji time or a quarter past 11 Melbourne time or various other times. So thank you, see you back in 15 minutes.
Thanks, everyone. We're just going to uh, have everyone who just spoke in that first session for a quick, quick screen grab photo, if that's OK. I think there's a couple of you left to come in. Um, won't take too long, and then I'll let you all go and grab a, a quick coffee or, or two or tea. Good. Sounds good. And I'd just add thanks so much to the team, Alex, Silky and Chatnam as well, who've been doing such a great job uh, yep. briefing everyone and pulling together the interviews that sat behind all of these. Stanley, I don't, uh, is there any chance of turning on a light? We're only seeing a, yeah, a very dark shadow of yourself. <laughs> okay. Right, yeah, the problem is the light's behind you, so you're, yeah, that's better. Yep. Oh, fast. Sorry, all. All right, let's just add you all in. Might take another minute. Yeah. <coughs> that's there. <clears throat> All right, so I think we can do nine at a time. Right. So if I could ask the, the nine of you that are on screen at the moment, so we'll just uh, give a wave or a smile in three. One, two, three. All right. Okay, fantastic. Um, and I'll remove that for all of you. And feel free to turn off your screens, those of you who just were on that shot, so I don't get confused as to who is who. <laughs> there we go. And I think we had Mia in there. The next one, Robert. If I've missed any of you, we, we can edit this at the end. There we go. Sulky and Chatnam and Regina. Fantastic. And Atsushi, I don't know if you can hear us, but you, you opened us at the, at the beginning of the session. So please feel free to join if you, if you can. That's all right. Okay, we'll just do one more. One, two, three. Fantastic. Thank you all. All right, please take a break. Um, we'll, we'll restart in, uh, in just over 10 minutes. Lexi, we don't log off or we do? No, please stay around. Um, stay you can always rejoin, but I'll just uh, put a cover slide up. Okay.
Welcome back, everybody. I think we're just about ready to start part two of the forum. I hope everyone's had a, a good break and refreshed the brain. <clears throat> so we, we segue now from having heard from quite a number of the country spokesperson about all of the initiatives that they're undertaking. Uh, the second half of this forum we're now going to hear from a number of the partner organisations which are working with uh, the island countries towards sustainable urban development. Uh, before that, I just wanted to acknowledge the fact that we have quite a few other people on the call today representing quite important organisations around the region. Uh, and this is not an exhaustive list, but certainly we have representatives from UN Women, uh, from Piango, uh, a number of local governments, uh, including Australia and New Zealand, so welcome. Uh, the government of the Philippines is attending. That's, that's fantastic to have you aboard as well. Uh, a Pacific neighbour, I guess. Uh, the Fiji Association of Planners, the United Nations Disaster Office, UNDRR, etc. So uh, we don't have a full list, but we would like to welcome particularly those special guests who are tuning in today. So now we're going to introduce to you the Pacific Partnership for the New Urban Agenda, a, a group of development partners in the region who have been working together uh, over the last 18 months or so to help to support sustainable urban development in the Pacific Islands. Uh, and to do that, I would like to introduce um, well, someone who probably needs no introduction, and that's Ms. Karabais Tauaba from the Commonwealth Local Government Forum. Uh, Karabais is the Pacific Regional Director. She's based in Suva, uh, and she's now going to do a brief presentation to us to explain what is this Pacific Partnership and how can we work with you? So over to Karabais. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Just waiting for Carabais to come online. We've done very well today in terms of connectivity. I think everyone would agree. Um, so hopefully CLGF Office Pacific will be able to come in. Yes, coming on now. Okay, look, we need to um, move to plan B. That's that's fine. Uh, I think everyone in the Pacific is very used to going from plan A to plan B. Sometimes we need to go to plan C, which is a bit of a worry. Uh, so why, why don't we just say that um, the Pacific Partnership New Urban Agenda was formed coming out of the last uh, Pacific Urban Forum. Um, it's, um, it's a partnership of approximately eight organisations. And we're going to hear from, I think, all eight organisations over the next um, 40 minutes or so, so I don't need to list them all. Uh, we pick up on the four pillars of the new urban agenda being social, well, they're the pillars we've been hearing about this morning. So uh, uh, social equity, environment, resilience, urban economy, urban governance. Uh, and there are quite a number of initiatives that we're helping to drive. Uh, so I think we can go to the first speaker from the partnership, and that is quite rightly UN Habitat, who anchors the Pacific Partnership. Uh, and so if we're ready, I could hand across to Inga Corte, who's the head of the multi-country office in Fiji for UN Habitat. Uh, and I'm just hoping that Alexi can progress the slides for Inga, and we can jump into the UN Habitat presentation. Well done. Okay, Inga, over to you. Thank you. Not hearing you yet. You must be muted. Okay. That's Can better. you hear me now? Yeah, all yours. Perfect. 
Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, greetings from the Pacific. I really hope that the internet will work for me because I think Curry Bus is just a few, a few streets down the road. So let, let's hope it works for me. So uh, yeah, greetings from the UN Habitat office here in Fiji. I'll just be briefly introducing our engagement in the Pacific. And in the interest of time, I think we're all just um, take it very briefly and go into more detailed questions later on in the Q&A. Next slide, please. So UN Habitat is the UN agency, of course, focusing on urban development in cities and what we call the, the built environment. And our main work is naturally um, centered around SDG 11, um, which is about promoting and supporting you know, sustainable cities, human settlements, communities, and leaving no one and especially no place behind. Um, and we do that generally through policy advice and technical assistance, collaborative action, just like the Pacific Partnership, but also our patent. Inger, I'm afraid we might have lost you. Um, if you can hear us, it might be worth just turning off your, your video and just trying with audio. It does look like we've uh, lost both of our Fiji partners right now. Um, so, good night, Bath. I'm good. back. Um, okay, I'm back the Carabice, you're online. Yep. Okay, would we, how about we go back to Carabice's presentation, Alex, Alexi? Here we go. <laughs> Just back. <laughs> All right. Carabas, we were just, if, if you missed it, we were just up to introducing the members of the steering committee. You have them there? Uh, not, not yet, but over to you for that. All right, all right. So thank you very much. I can start now. Please. Yes. So thank you very much, Steve. I'm sorry I was late. I was uh, just going to the, um, the loop for some time. Yeah, so it <laughs> is my it is my pleasant task this morning to introduce to you the Pacific Partnership for the implementation of the new urban agenda, known also as the PPNUA. I'm sure this is not the first time that you have heard about the PPNUA. It is nearly two years now when the PPNUA was born following the fifth Pacific Urban Forum in Nandi in July 2019. One of the key issues that was discussed by participants at the fifth Pacific Urban Forum was that while much has already been done in the region to consider and develop solutions to urbanization, a key barrier has been the absence of a body to coordinate or drive implementation of existing urban commitments. Therefore, participants proposed that the regional body is required to facilitate a range of actions mm. that came out of the Pacific, the fifth Pacific Urban Forum. And that is why the PPNUA was established. Okay, a lot have already been discussed and covered by other people before me about the purpose of the, the PPNUA and the four pillars, so I will skip that. And uh, now I will go to the members of the PPNUA, please. Can we go back? Yes. So there are eight members of the PPNUA. First, the UN Habitat, who is currently the chair of the PPNUA, and UN SCAP, who are both from the UN agencies. Then the Commonwealth Local Government Forum Pacific Project, who is the secretariat of the PPNUA, and ICLE, who is Local Government for Sustainability Oceania. Both are intergovernmental organizations. Then Europe, the Eastern Regional Organization for Planning and Human Settlement, and Compass Housing Services, both from Australia uh, and uh, NGOs. Last are the um, Monash University Sustainable Development Institute and the University of Melbourne, who are both from academia. 
Can we go now to the next one? Next slide, please. Yeah, I think I need to uh, talk a little bit about PPNU commitment. So the PPNU is committed to work together in partnership with Pacific Island countries to support urban stakeholders and other key stakeholders, key actors in implementing the outcomes of the fifth Pacific Urban Forum. Le leveraging the respective work program that supports supports the overall purpose of the PPNUA. Third, supporting the integrated delivery of actions across the four pillars of the PPNUA agenda, the new Pacific Urban Agenda. Fourth, to establish a joint office and website for the PPNUA. And lastly, to make sure that the, the Pacific Urban Forum is recognized as a, an official body. Next, next slide, please. Let me share with you some of the work that the PPNUA has done so far. In terms of key event, members of the PPNUA were at the 7th Asia Pacific Urban Forum in October 2019 in Malaysia and also at the World Urban Forum in February 2020 in Abu Dhabi, advocating the outcome of the 5th Pacific Urban Forum. Now we go on to the institutional setup. A steering committee and a working team have already been set up and operating now. A joint office has been established in 2020 and currently housed at the CLGF office in Suva. An urban sector working group has been established and I want to use this opportunity to thank this working group for doing an excellent job in organizing this forum. Last is the BPNU a is now part of Slovakia, the community of practice host by UNDP. Lastly, joint programming between the, the partners. As part of the PPNUA outreach, a series of activities has been done. The first was a webinar on local economic development in the Pacific that was held in October 2020. Second is this virtual Pacific Urban Forum today. There are also joint projects that have been done or going to be done to support the Pacific New Urban Agenda among the partners. And this will be discussed by each member of the PPNUA after this. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just heard from the countries this morning of the work that they are doing in their respective countries. They also reminding us of the, some of the challenges that they are experiencing in their towns and cities. The challenges is too great and too complex to be left to just one organization or entity. Sustainable urbanization requires a whole of government approach and the mobilization of non-government agencies, the private sector, and of course, citizens who are at the front, the forefront of everything that we do. After this, members of the BPNU AU will present their areas of work, what they are doing, and hopefully that will give us a a total picture of what is available from the PPNUA and from the countries. At the round table discussion, we can continue to discuss and share knowledge of the current stage of progress and challenges towards sustainable urban development. So we can decide on the roadmap that we can do together to achieve our urban agenda goals. I thank you, Steve, and over to you. And that one is the uh, photo of the uh, the World Urban Forum that was we did the uh, launching of the fifth Pacific Urban Forum outcomes. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Carabais. And there are certainly some familiar faces on the um, on that photo. All right, so um, that introduces this session now, and we'll try again with you in habitats. Now, how are we doing, um, Inga? Are you I'm, back I'm so sorry, Steve. Yes, I'm it's back. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, over to you. Thank you. I'll just leave the um, the camera off, I guess. Um, and if we can go, just go to the second slide already. Yeah, I think in the interest of time. Perfect. I'll just briefly introduce our activities here in the Pacific. So, um, under our Pacific Urbanization Program. We're focusing, of course, act on actively supporting the Pacific Partnership and the Pacific Urban Forum, which is this year virtually, um, is, is part of that engagement. Um, and for example, um, two years ago, the Pacific Regional Report was presented at the last COF here in, in Fiji, as um, was mentioned by Alex also earlier on. Um, 
and hopefully the next Pacific Urban Forum can be in person again. Um, in addition, of course, we, we participate in the, in the usual activities as the Urban October, uh, World Habitat Day and World Cities Day. Our climate resilience programs, as were already briefly mentioned in the presentations by Solomon Islands and Fiji, focus on supporting the national and municipal governments um, as well as the communities in reducing climate vulnerabilities and informal settlements. And in these projects, we, we conduct um, comprehensive vulnerability and risk assessments. And based on these, then we, we come up with climate action plans on the community as well as the municipal level, and then implement selected activities together with our target communities. Um, under uh, together with the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, the GCOM, we organize the uh, I4C Innovate for Cities conference, which is a virtual global and regional event um, that brings together science and innovation, as well as policy and practice to enable and support cities to take accelerated and more ambitious climate action. Um, we're also currently implementing the participatory slum upgrading program as heard by Fiji and Kiribati um, and I think Papua New Guinea um, also mentioned it briefly. So PSUP is a joint effort of um, the ACP uh, group of states, uh, the European Commission um, and UN Habitat just to strengthen national approaches to, to sustainable urbanization focusing or through informal settlements upgrading analysis and 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 the formalization of prevention strategies um, and a regional PSUP for the pacific is under development then we also of course strongly engage in COVID-19 recovery and, um, and planning through regional and national analysis and, and assessments and reports we supported uh, a GIS atlas together with the Royal uh, Melbourne Institute of Technology RMIT um, in Fiji also we we implemented COVID-19 recovery activities and those focused on, on urban food security and formal settlements through urban farming and during the most recent outbreak here in Fiji we also assisted the government in, in devising strategies on community engagement with informal settlements um, and last but not least no that's that, that's all from my side um, you see the list here um, uh, that have more more details and of course we have a Q&A later on where we can where we can go into more detail over to you Steve Thank you, Inga. Uh, yes, you did very well to cover such uh, huge territory in a few minutes. And I think we can all appreciate that the key role that UN Habitat is playing in the Pacific. And we all, all really um, appreciate the leadership and very happy to work together on that. We now move to our second speaker um, of the partnership, and that's uh, representing the, the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, uh, otherwise known as UNSCAP. Uh, and we're going to hear from Mr. Kurt Garrigan, and Kurt is the Chief of the Sustainable Urban Development Section. So over to you, Kurt. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you uh, also to all the organizers, the working group, and the, the, uh, the partners in the, in the forum for organizing and, and uh, inviting SCAP to participate and share some of our activities as well. Uh, if I can go to the next slide. Uh, just a very little uh, introduction about SCAP very briefly. Um, SCAP, I think, as, as many of you know, are one of the five regional commissions in the UN system. We serve as the regional development arm of the, uh, of the UN Secretariat, uh, promoting cooperation among countries uh, across the region. Uh, the SCAP Commission is the largest regional intergovernmental platform. We have 53 member states, so widest geographic area, nine associate members. We provide capacity building and uh, insight into the evolving economic, social, and environmental dynamics across the region. Uh, our mandates are really revolve around uh, helping to promote uh, the global development agendas and strengthen regional cooperation among uh, member states to, uh, to, to advance progress against those agendas. We're headquartered in Bangkok, uh, as most of you know, but we have uh, five seats sub-regional offices, uh, including the one based in Suva for the Pacific. Um, as it relates to the to uh, urban development and, and the urban issues, uh, capacity building, regional dialogues, um, and, and other uh, activities, including the development of tools and resources, are delivered for the sustainable urban development section, um, which uh, I, I'm, I, along with my colleagues, uh, work on. 
uh, and we're housed within the Environment and Development Division. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the general or the, the broader ongoing work that uh, SCAP is doing is, is, uh, is shown here. We have the Pacific Climate Change Migration Human Security Program uh, that works with other UN agencies to increase uh, protection of vulnerable communities. Um, there is the inequality, discrimination, and inclusion um, work. Uh, sorry. Are we on the right slide? Yes, okay. Uh, that uh, has provided a technical report uh, and does analysis across uh, seven Pacific Island countries. Uh, we have um, some work on uh, informal and traditional social protection in Samoa, including a policy brief that was developed um, on strengthening resilience of Pacific Island states. Um, we do on an annual basis an economic and social survey, which provides an out outlook for the region uh, that also includes sub-regional uh, outlooks. Uh, the most recent economic and social survey uh, was released uh, earlier this, this year and looked at the post-pandemic uh, outlook for uh, facilitating green, inclusive, and re resilient recoveries. We also do an annual uh, SDG progress report uh, that looks at uh, how member states are proceeding against the SDGs. We provide some work uh, to support countries on their voluntary national reviews uh, in the follow-up and review process. Um, and those reports are both uh, available online. I wanted to note that yesterday, um, SCAP released the Asia Pacific Disaster Report uh, at its regional conversation series, which um, coincided with the Ministerial Panel on Disaster, Climate and Health Resilience uh, held during the seventh session of the SCAP uh, Committee on Disaster Risk Reduction. That is also available online and again was just released yesterday. Next slide, please. The specific urban work that we do, I wanted to highlight just a few. The Asia Pacific Mayors Academy was launched uh, at the Asia Pacific Urban Forum in October of 2019. Uh, this is a, a program with a number of partners, including UN Habitat, the UN University Institute for Advanced Study of Sustainability, UCLG ASPAC, uh, APRU, and IGES. Uh, and this really um, targets newly elected or newly appointed mayors and local leaders uh, to introduce them to the global development agenda um, and provide them with some knowledge and tools to manage uh, urban growth in their locations. Uh, we provide a lot of support around localizing the SDGs through various projects, but we've also provided and developed uh, with partners specific guidance on voluntary local reviews, uh, and that supports cities to really uh, identify their progress against the SDG framework uh, in support of uh, both national objectives and the 2030 agenda. Uh, and we have the Penang Platform for Sustainable Urban Development, uh, which also engages a number of partners, including UN Habitat, Urban Ice Malaysia, UNDP, and, and others. Uh, and the Penang Platform is also launched at APU uh, and is a co-convener of an activity that we are uh, planning for in late October. It is a regional partners forum. It'll be held the 28th and 29th of October, uh, along with UN Habitat and SCAP. And this will lead to the planning and, uh, and thematic focus areas for the next Asia Pacific Urban Forum to be held in 2023. Um, UN Habitat and partners in, in the Pacific uh, <coughs> Forum have really provided lots of input into the Asia Pacific Urban Forum, and this will provide an opportunity to do so for the next. Uh, and I think uh, that's it. Next slide. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Kurt, uh, it was good to hear from UN SCAP as well. So we have UN Habitat and UN SCAP providing underpinnings really for a lot of the work that we're doing. Kurt, I just wondered the report that you referred to that was released yesterday, the disaster risk report, is it possible for you to put a link in the chat yes. uh, so that we can go straight to it? That'd be great. Yes, Thank sir, you. I'll do so. Excellent. Uh, we now move on to the next pair of partners, and these are two prominent um, non-government organisations operating in the Pacific. Uh, firstly, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Jane Stanley. Uh, and Jane, can 
explain her role. I think it might be immediate past vice president or something pretty impressive like that of EROF, and also explain what EROF stands for, Jane, because I've always get tangled up in the acronym. But yeah, handing over to Jane. Thanks, Steve. Uh, if I can have the slide, please. So EROF, here it is, the Eastern Regional Organization for Planning and Human Settlements. Uh, so we're a, a multidisciplinary peak body for the Asia Pacific region, particularly dealing with the built environment. Uh, we don't have our own financial resources. We rather are, are a collection of practicing professionals across all sorts of different uh, generalist and specialist areas. So we're able to get together teams and to offer advice in different areas. Uh, a number of our uh, members have extensive work in the Pacific region. Um, but EROF is part of a, the organization that has its secretariat in Malaysia. Uh, and we have chapters in a number of different countries. Uh, we've recently established, after the last Pacific Urban Forum, we established a Pacific chapter. Um, the support for Pipinua is largely being provided through the Australian chapter. And these are all organized as separate um, entities. And then there are, are chapters in Malaysia, Philippines, um, Indonesia, Pakistan, we've got one forming in Nepal, a whole range of countries through, through Southeast Asia particularly. Okay, next, next slide. So I wanted to focus on what we're actually doing. Um, and we're doing things in the Pacific as well as some relevant things um, elsewhere. So in the Pacific, um, we've been focusing on training programs particularly. Uh, and in terms of SDG implementation. Um, so a lot of the work that our members have done has been in association with other um, agencies, uh, donor agencies and other partners. Uh, we've done work on um, online training and in-person training in local economic development, particularly for local government. Uh, and that's increasingly focused on the blue and green economy and um, also on the informal economy. And our members have worked with uh, other agencies in focusing on the informal economy and markets. So that's all SDG 8. Uh, we've got members working on asset management and sustainable um, infrastructure um, in the Pacific. Uh, and we're increasingly focusing on climate action. So infrastructure is fitting in with the, the second pillar of the Pacific Urban Forum. Climate action um, is related to the urban economy and other pillars, I suppose, SDG 13. Um, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, the work we're doing outside of the Pacific that's relevant, um, we're working with UN Habitat in developing an online training program in how to develop housing policies. Uh, and that's at the national as well as local level. Um, that's initially for delivery in Malaysia, um, but it's being designed so that it be, can be customised for delivery to other countries. And I raise that because uh, housing policy has been mentioned by some of the, the country representatives here. And we've also developed some training programmes on partnerships, SDG 17. Um, and um, that's also um, being developed into an online training course. So that relates to the fourth pillar of urban governance in the Pacific New Urban Agenda. Um, we've done work on waste management as well. Um, and we ran a webinar on uh, reconfiguring waste management for a circular economy. We have a technical working group um, that has experts in all sorts of areas in terms of new technologies that can contribute to waste management, water management, uh, habitat, and, um, and other areas of, of sustainable development. We're also promoting regenerative agriculture and aquaculture, part of the green and blue economy. Um, and then I wanted to mention that we have a webinar coming up on September the 24th on what does climate justice look like. Uh, now this is particularly focused at the Pacific region. Um, we have four streams here. Uh, and we're trying to give voice to people who otherwise might not be heard and then take these voices into the Innovate for Cities conference that UN Habitat is organising and has mentioned in October in the lead in to COP26 in Glasgow. So there will be four streams of this webinar. Um, one is just intergenerational justice, looking at youth voices, then um, 
uh, perspectives indigenous peoples and we're picking up First Nations from Australia, Maori voices as well as uh, Pacific um, leaders. Um, then we have a session on vulnerable small island states uh, and then another one on vulnerable coastal and inland communities. So if you are interested in getting involved in this, please contact us and we can keep you in the loop, give you more information. We have reserved some spaces because we're on the steering committee for the Pacific component going into the bigger October conference. So um, we can get you involved in that if you'd like your voices to be heard. And I'm also, we're also launching a, an art competition for children on uh, climate change. Uh, we're looking for participating schools in different countries. We don't want millions of entries, but we thought we'd pick schools in different countries. So if you're connected with a school that you think might like to participate, please contact me um, and uh, I can link you into that activity. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Jane. That's terrific. And uh, Jane will be coming back into the program for the last session and helping to facilitate the roundtable. I did notice one of the questions in the Q&A is around um, gender aspects in planning. And I just wanted to point out that Jane, I know, does quite a lot of work uh, in the Pacific on gender issues, both in her own right and also with um, Eurof. Uh, moving on to the other of the, the um, non-government organisations we're hearing from today. Uh, and we're going to hear from Compass Housing. Uh, and I think I've totally lost my notes here. Uh, we're hearing from, 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 here we go, Professor David Adamson. Uh, David is the Chief Strategic Engagement Officer of Compass Housing Services. So David, over to you, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Steve. Um, and uh, I'd like to start uh, by thanking my colleague, Ben Wong for, um, representing Compass in the partnership and uh, facilitating my participation today. Um, if I could have the first slide, please. Uh, so uh, Compass is uh, a, a, an international NGO. We provide housing options for uh, largely the poorest and most vulnerable communities in Australia and in New Zealand. And we have a number of small international development programs in Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands. Uh, we're a member of UN Global Compact Network and part of my role is very much to promote the SDGs uh, regionally in the Pacific but also very much in, uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and we have uh, internally aligned all our policies and programs with both the SDGs and the NUA and we currently assist other organisations to do that. Uh, we have a very clear mission and it is that all people, uh, regardless of where they are and where they uh, where they exist, uh, have appropriate and affordable housing and are engaged in sustainable communities. Uh, and we want to provide homes uh, that empower people, connect communities and influence the future for those uh, residents. Uh, and we very much uh, see place-based action uh, as the way to achieve that uh, and mobilising the communities themselves uh, to uh, achieve improvements. Um, if I could have the next slide. So, um, some of our current projects. Um, I think the first one to mention uh, is in Vanuatu at Cold Vila. Uh, and we rebuilt uh, with the local community uh, and the church organization there uh, the community stage that was um, destroyed in uh, uh, Cyclone Pam. Uh, and we're in the process of transforming that, uh, the rooms that are associated with that, into a community hub. Uh, you can see some of our colleagues there. Uh, moving furniture into that that was purchased recently. Uh, and we're now trying to look at local service providers who might be able to provide some outreach uh, 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 provision in, into that uh, facility. Our second major project there is um, uh, a lo local market in the freshwater informal settlement. Um, and the women are there currently sleep out overnight in the open air. And we have been for some time trying to develop some secure accommodation to support them. Uh, not only in their economic activity, but of course in their uh, safety from uh, particularly sexual violence, which, which can be a risk for them. Um, that's uh, a, a project that's, that's currently stalled, um, largely because of COVID. Um, but we're also in discussions with the Asian Development Bank, uh, as they have an initiative in, in the same market space, and we want to make sure that the two mesh. Uh, and we've just made contact to, uh, to try and establish that. Um, and then we have a general uh, uh, aspiration to create 
uh, community hubs. We operate these in Australia. It's a model we think has a high relevance to uh, informal settlements uh, in Pacific communities. Um, and then that brings me to a, a, a second project we're involved with, uh, and that is the um, evacuation center project uh, in the part of the Oniara Climate Resilience Adaption Program led by Course UN Habitat uh, and RMIT University, which we're very pleased to be a partner with on this. Uh, we're a member of the project team, um, and it's really designed to develop uh, more resilient infrastructure for vulnerable communities uh, and informal settlements uh, to uh, mitigate future climate impacts and, uh, and disaster uh, events and uh, make those communities more able to uh, be resilient in the face of those challenges. Uh, particularly, I think, looking at uh, you know, protection of youth, women, children, uh, elderly and people with disabilities. Um, that again is uh, relatively on hold because of COVID, uh, which has in many ways frustrated our aspirations to have had uh, some of these projects completed by now, of course. And uh, we're very conscious that uh, uh, we hope to hit the ground running as soon as travel becomes possible again uh, and implementation of some of these projects uh, is renewed. Um, so that's probably it from me and uh, happy to hand over to the next speaker. Uh, thank you, David, and I can certainly endorse your comments about how COVID has disrupted so many great plans. Uh, and I think we're just all holding on until we can get back into the region. Okay, um, so now we'd like to move on to our academic partners, and we're going to hear from the University of Melbourne. Uh, and we're finally going to get the face to the voice that we've been hearing today. We're going to meet um, Alexi Trundle now. Um, uh, and uh, just a minute, trying to find my notes. Uh, yeah, Alexi is research fellow for the University of Melbourne Centre for Cities. Alexi has been driving the platform for us today from behind the scenes, and now he's going to present. So thanks, Alexi. Over to you. Thanks, Steve. And uh, Steve's put me in it for any technical issues that we might have. So apologies for any that have sort of popped up along the way. Um, and I'm being asked to unmute myself by myself, so apologies for that delay. Um, I don't want to sort of drag this out too long, but I just wanted to reflect a little bit on, on how universities, uh, uh, particularly universities that are surrounding the region in, in Australia and New Zealand can potentially contribute to, uh, to the agenda, to the Pacific New Urban Agenda and, and where uh, a lot of the sort of capacity needs, I suppose, and, and sort of areas for additional training and strengthening have, have really come out in, in this morning session. Um, just very briefly, the University of Melbourne's title is fairly self-explanatory. We're uh, 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 one of the, the many universities that are in Melbourne that are engaged in, in the Pacific, and we've heard about RMIT University already, and, and I work closely with a number of uh, my colleagues from there who I know are on this call, and, I, and um, I'm sure Monash University, who's coming up next, will have more to say as well. But I think that the, the bigger point really is, is to reflect on how, as, as training facilities and as uh, as fairly broad reaching research capabilities, we can provide assistance to uh, in-country partners that are on this call. Um, so uh, I just quickly note that the University of Melbourne has a renewed focus on the Pacific as part of its new uh, strategic um, plan, the uh, Advancing Melbourne 2030. And within that, there's a focus on some of the grand challenges that the Asia Pacific more broadly, but in, in particular Pacific Islands face. So climate change is, is really highlighted there. Uh, and there are some fairly su substantial new initiatives coming out of the University of Melbourne in that space uh, that are looking to engage with, with um, Pacific Island governments, but also civil society representatives and organisations and, and communities in, in the Pacific. Um, I'm particularly speaking from the perspective of uh, a member of the, the newly formed Melbourne Centre for Cities. So we in particular look at the ways that networks and international processes and urban governance can collectively share knowledge, uh, build, strengthen networks and push upwards international governments to support uh, local urban agendas. I think rather than sort of focusing on the mission statement and, and where the, the University of Melbourne works, I, I just wanted to highlight a couple of key uh, programs that exist in the Pacific and also reflect maybe uh, on, on that teaching side of things. Uh, I, I remember at Part 5, uh, Dame, Dame Meg Taylor uh, provided some really salient remarks that it's about the next generation sort of picking up the helms 
of urban issues in the Pacific. And I think from, from the work that we do and the research that we do, that very much is bearing out in terms of where people are identifying with as Pacific Islanders, uh, but also the focus on emerging issues in, in Pacific Island countries, uh, whether that's popular culture in informal settlements, um, straight out of black sands and then those sorts of issues that, that, are, that are sort of emanating through music and through art. Uh, and the way that those those sort of local issues are being communicated and engaged with internationally, uh, or if that's a, uh, a matter of, for instance, for, for individuals such as Dame Meg, uh, actually going through their, their uh, studies at, at the University of Melbourne. So she's one of our alumni, and I think it's important to recognise that um, we're not just a research institution, we actually have a, a sort of a longer standing legacy in, in terms of trying to provide those skills to individuals through training initiatives. Uh, one, a couple of programs just to quickly note. So we have a pretty diverse portfolio, I suppose. Uh, we also work in the, on the sustainable development goals and uh, working closely with, in particular, the City of Melbourne, developing a voluntary local review to complement uh, national and other subnational efforts. Uh, but we have a broader challenge which engages with Pacific Island cities, as well as cities in the US, New Zealand and Australia, uh, to share approaches to localising the sustainable development goals at the city scale. Uh, we're going into the second phase of that now, um, and, and you can see more about that on our website, so I won't dwell on it too much. We've heard a, a few examples that draw on the Climate Resilient Honiara project, but I just really like to highlight that because it really brings out the collaborative nature of the of the partnership and, and what we're trying to achieve here, which is to draw on each other's strengths. Uh, so as mentioned, this is um, adaptation fund supported financially. It, it is uh, led by UN Habitat and it is provided with a, a very extensive body of technical expertise and, and assistance out of RMIT University, which in turn reaches out to the University of Melbourne Campus Housing and, and other organisations, including ICLEI, uh, to, to really draw out different strengths and capabilities uh, across those organisations. So I think it's a really good example, and you can see that in that it's sort of coming up again and again in these presentations. There are, of course, a number of other major projects, um, and I just wanted to flag that the University of Melbourne has fairly extensive health capabilities. That's one of our key uh, research strengths being attached to the major tertiary hospital in Melbourne and most of its research centres. So uh, there are a number of discrete programs that reach out into the Pacific. Uh, but as one of the leading universities in Australia, we also have the ability to push upwards into the Australian government and state government and to sort of provide that facilitation and I suppose agitation role uh, in, in supporting the urban agenda with some of the other development and donor community members. So I'll really leave it there. Um, I'm going to come back a little bit later to uh, help facilitate the roundtable. So I think that's enough for me and uh, back to you, Steve. Okay, thank you, Alexi. Uh, very good. Uh, and look, I should also mention the same project, the Climate Resilient Honiara project. I think at least four of the partner organisations we're hearing from today are working on the Honiara project, including ICLEI. Uh, we actually handle the relationship with the City Council and with the Ward councillors as our particular contribution to that. Moving on now to our other academic partner, which is the University of Monash. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce um, research fellow, Dr. Matthew French from Monash University. Uh, Matthew, over to you. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Steve. And uh, good morning. Well, still morning here in Melbourne, uh, colleagues and friends. And uh, it's fantastic to be here today and, and to be part of this group um, on behalf of Monash University. Let's flick to the next slide. Uh, so I'm co-presenting today with a colleague, Izoa Vakariwa from uh, Fiji, who will speak in a second. Um, but firstly, just a bit about Monash University. The headline message really is that as a university, we're trying to break down the barriers between pioneering research and the translation of that research into impact to change people's lives. And so we're really proud to be part of the group here looking at the urban issues in particular and how we may be able to support partners in the region uh, to develop you know, new innovative solutions to some of these pressing urban challenges. We're currently working in Fiji, which we'll hear from Izoa uh, in a second, as well as Marshall Islands, Tonga and others in a whole range of sectors, uh, including you know, climate resilience and low emissions development strategies, as well as urban upgrading and informal settlement revitalization. Um, so next slide please, and I'll pass over here to Izoa, 
who is the director of RISE uh, based there in Suva. And as I was going to tell us a bit more about RISE, which is a flagship program uh, led by Monash, uh, but involves 27 partner institutions. Uh, so over to you, uh, Azoa. Fenaka. Thank you, Matthew. Um, for those that I'm having the pleasure of meeting for the first time today, um, my name is uh, Isova Karewa, and as um, um, Matthew's, um, in a fancy way, introduced me, uh, my role is um, you know, to help establish the program and support the work that's ongoing uh, here in Suva. Um, so RISE um, is an action research uh, project led by Monash University through partnerships with um, a couple of institutions here in Suva. Uh, the two universities, um, Fiji National University, University of the South Pacific, and also an NGO called uh, Live and Learn Environment Education. Um, that's worked quite extensively in informality or informal settlements uh, as part of its work. Um, uh, started the program here a couple of years ago, um, and we were fortunate at the start of the program to have uh, or be able to anchor support from government, um, aligning to the Fiji Ministry of Housing and Community Development. What the program uh, what we're hoping to achieve through the program is to test um, a water sensitive approach to revise, revitalizing informal settlements or working with informal settlements in managing uh, water resources, particularly wastewater management and working with local partnerships uh, through government with the communities that we work with. Uh, we work with uh, 24 settlements across Fiji and Indonesia and in Fiji we're working with 12 informal settlements for those of you that are familiar with the Greater Suva area, so 12 informal settlements that span across the four municipalities from Lani uh, through to Nostori. We're working also with um, uh, local uh, leaders. Uh, obviously, when we're working in informal settlements, uh, land tenure uh, is an issue that um, we have to work through. So obviously working with the local landowners, um, uh, the state as well as a local uh, partner, um, to coordinate and identify pathways uh, in which you can work um, together um, as we're developing uh, not only the, 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 the research, but also more, more importantly, the intervention that we're trying to test um, uh, within informal settlements. We've employed uh, what's called a randomized control trial. So we randomly selected uh, six of the 12 settlements where we will introduce the intervention uh, first, and that's been uh, done in 2019. Um, so right now, uh, we're working to progress uh, the development uh, of the designs uh, of the intervention in, in our first six settlements. And hopefully over um, a look at the impact that the intervention has uh, on the health uh, of the residents of the settlements that we work in, the environment and how they all interrelate. Um, is what we're looking at. Um, happy to share the progress so far uh, that we've uh, completed our baseline um, in 2019 as well. And we're currently working through um, with the leadership of the University of Fiji National University, uh, working through our baseline paper that we're hopefully uh, able to share uh, what we found in terms of uh, conditions. Uh, within the informal settlements that we work with, and hopefully we will we'll get the results published um, in the near future. Uh, we also have a demonstration site um, uh, here in Suva um, that we're working with uh, that we hope uh, will um, will be able to demonstrate not only the technology, uh, but also the processes that we've had to uh, work through. Um, through, you know, with our partners to establish um, the intervention uh, and also the impact that it has within the environment. Uh, and that demonstration site is almost um, you know, nearing completion uh, at the moment, and hopefully we'll be able to launch uh, and, you know, invite a few partners in country um, uh, as well uh, to that demonstration site. Um, in, terms, in terms of next um, uh, steps, uh, again, like I mentioned, we're making um, uh, progress 
um, significant progress in terms of um, the scaling up of the work that we need to do uh, yes, as part of the intervention in the informal settlements. Obviously, COVID's uh, affected everyone. Um, uh, we're, in, we're no exception. Uh, but um, our teams are continuing to work uh, you know, with our local partners here to progress the work. Uh, and we're happy to note that um, uh, you know, we've been able to progress a lot of the design uh, work uh, while uh, managing the COVID uh, you know, uh, impacts that it has on our community engagement. So while we haven't been able to carry out in a, you know, any significant engagement at the community level, we've been able to progress a lot of processes uh, in terms of the development of designs uh, and application processes, and hopefully we'll um, get the construction uh, underway. Um, so that, in a nutshell, uh, is the RISE program uh, with the, you know, specifics from the Fiji. Um, more information can be found on our website, which is at the bottom right, uh, but I'm also happy to uh, you know, take any questions um, later. Thank you, Steve. Back to you. Uh, thank you very much, Isa and David. Um, and it's interesting that you did mention the um, the local universities as well, because obviously the counterparts in the Pacific uh, academic institutions are a critical part of this work. Uh, so we, we move on to our, our final two partners, and this is the last of the, the presentations before we open up for discussion. Um, firstly, to hear from the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, uh, Pacific from Carabice, um, who's the Pacific Regional Director. Uh, and obviously we are nearing the end of our time. So I'd ask Carabice and also Bernie to try to keep the comments fairly brief. So thanks Carabice, over to you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Local Government Forum, also known as COGF Pacific, was first established in the Pacific in 2001 and was scaled up in 2004. We are currently based in Suva, Fiji. COG headquarters is based in London in the UK. Uh, our we, COGF is a member organization and our work is mainly with the ministries who are responsible for local government, individual councils, national local government association, stakeholders and even traditional structures. We also work with development partners, donors and regional bodies such as the Pacific Island Forum. We also consider ourselves as the intergovernmental organization because we both work with national government and individual member councils and the communities. So our mission, our focus is uh, CLGF is designed to support, promote and strengthen competent, responsive and accountable democratic local government institutions. CLGF also assists to establish and strengthen local, go local governance mechanisms that engage all members of the community to participate in local decisions. CLGF assisted in making processes and improve accountability and transparency to ensure communities are empowered and local government is positioned to play its full role in the achievement of sustainable development goals. Where do we work? Our members are in 10 member countries, in 10 countries in the Pacific, namely the Cook Islands, Kiribati, Fiji Islands, Papua New Guinea, Marshall Islands, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. Note that all of these countries are Commonwealth countries, except for the Marshall Islands. Next slide, please. I want to go on to our activities, what we have done in the Pacific. Following on from previous work on promoting good local government, COGF Pacific has recently and currently involved in a number of capacity building projects, which include the following. The first one is on building local economic development planning and delivery capacity in Kiribati, the Cook Islands and Marshall Island. This is a project that is funded by the European Union, and its main objective is to build the capacity of national local government associations in local, in local economic development planning and delivery. The project was specifically designed to build local wealth and an enabling environment for LED and facilitate the creation of informal and formal networks 
among private, public, and community enterprises that will add value to any local resources that is available to local communities. The project was done in collaboration with Europe in all the three countries. The second one is building resilience, blue and green economies in Fiji. This is the project funded by the European Union, managed by the CLGF in the Caribbean and implemented in the Pacific by CLGF Pacific. The main objective of the project is promoting sustainable approaches to local economic development by empowering local government institutions to work with local businesses and key stakeholders in order to improve economic activities. The project is implemented in National Nausori Corridor and Sub Sub. Europe and ICLE is working together with us on this project. The third one is promoting a vibrant, diversified and sustainable local economy in Funafuti Tuvalu. The project is funded by Canada, implemented by Funafuti Town Council and managed by CLGF. The project is designed to support the community in Funafuti to develop and imp implement local models for climate change adaptation and resilience that provide opportunities for strengthening the local economy. It will support a vibrant and sustainable local economy with increased economic opportunities, especially for the women and enhance livelihood for the citizens of Tuvalu. The project again is implemented together with Europe and ICLE. The fourth one is on market for change in Fiji, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. This is the EU, UN Women Market for Change project and CLGF is implementing two of the project components that deals with the capacity building of market vendors, market managers and local government staff to ensure that markets are managed in a gender responsive manner. The, promote, the, the, the project promotes gender equality and women empowerment, focusing on marketplaces in Fiji, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. The last one is on sustainable urban resource management in Nasinu, Fiji. The project was designed to assist Nasinu Town Council to implement the SDGs by strengthening actions across the urban environment, social and economic systems. The project was part of the UN SCAP Sustainable Urban Resource Management Project developed to integrate the sustainable development goals into local action in support of the implementation of the 2030 Agenda in Asia and the Pacific. The project engaged a broad range of stakeholders in identifying and then implementing ways of improving waste management outcomes. Key partners here are the UN SCAP, UN Habitat, Nasinu and Nausori, and Savusavu Town Council, and the Fiji Ministry of Local Government. Lastly is our network. CLGF has established networks in most of its member countries, which consists of the following. The first one is Commonwealth Sustainable Cities Network. The second one is on Commonwealth Healthy Cities Network, Women in Local Government, and the Pacific Capital Cities Network. For more information, please check on our website. And I thank you. Over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, Karabais. Um, and ICLE is a very proud partner with CLGF. And <clears throat> finally, very happy to hand over to my colleague from ICLE Oceania office, uh, Bernie Cotter, who's the Managing Director of ICLE. Thanks, Bernie. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, uh, look, uh, we're, ICLE is really proud to be a member of the PPNUA. Um, a little bit about ICLE. Um, we're a, uh, a network of about 2,500 cities, towns and regions across 126 countries worldwide, 23 offices uh, across nine regions. And uh, one of those regions where uh, Steve Gawler is the regional director is Oceania. Um, ICLE has a a special um, accredited uh, space within the UN processes, uh, representing the local government constituency uh, in the areas of the, uh, climate and biodiversity. Um, we've got five development pathways that uh, uh, each of the regions uh, for ICLE, uh, adhere to and provide a range of programs. 
I'm going to talk about uh, one program and two opportunities uh, today. So if we go to uh, the next slide, Alexi, if that's all right. So one of the um, uh, one of the programs that we're secretariat for in Oceania is called the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. Uh, and it's nice to, to know that uh, there's a range of other city networks and UN partners who are, uh, are also partners uh, with the, uh, the Global Covenant of Mayors. So including uh, UN Habitat, UCLG, SPAC and UCLG generally, uh, C40 um, and CDP. And there's a whole range of uh, European partners uh, and others. So it's, uh, it's a fairly big deal uh, when it comes to uh, mobilising best uh, action and appropriate uh, action in terms of uh, climate activity. So as you can see on the slide, there's about 10,500 cities from 120 countries worldwide. Um, it's the largest uh, uh, global network of its kind, taking action on climate change. And uh, uh, already we have five urban areas within the Pacific as member members, and proud to say that uh, we have the, um, the honour of having uh, Lenikel town in uh, Vanuatu as the smallest participant, smallest population participant in the Global Covenant of Mayors. Um, so it's, some, it's a program that, uh, uh, that suits cities, towns of all sizes and shapes. Okay. Uh, as the global, uh, as the regional secretariat, uh, ICLE provides the uh, uh, GCOM services in, in Oceania. And so that's for Pacific Islands, New Zealand, Australia, and, and obviously globally. So if I move on to, to now, the next slide, please. So uh, just talk about a couple of opportunities. Um, being part of the Global Covenant of Mayors um, uh, comes with it some uh, vast array of resources uh, and help. Um, what uh, one of the opportunities might be very suitable in the Pacific is where is the uh, uh, through the funding through the European Union, uh, European Commission is to support five Pacific cities in developing comprehensive climate action plans and building the capacity locally. Uh, to implement those plans. So uh, those, uh, that is an, an open offer. And uh, we have a, a colleague in the Brussels office, Piero Remitti, which we can put you in touch with, who is looking at providing that service to, to five urban areas within in the Pacific. Um, the, uh, there is an open offer clearly with any town to be involved in the Global Covenant of Mayors as a member, and also to consider being involved in uh, two of the current um, uh, initiatives or campaigns in the lead up to COP26 in uh, Glasgow later in the year called Race to Resilience and Race to Zero. Okay, so clearly we're very keen to identify new towns and cities to join, uh, join in those climate programs. If I move on to the, the next opportunity, and again, this is a, an open opportunity uh, for uh, urban areas, towns, cities, is that uh, uh, looking um, at uh, using the GAP fund, which is a 100 million euro fund to uh, accelerate uh, investments in cities developing low carbon and well-planned urbanisation. Uh, less than half of that 500, uh, 100 million euros has been allocated at this stage. And we've been um, in touch with uh, our colleague in the uh, Global Covenant Mayor's office, again in, in Brussels, uh, Asma Hina, uh, who is very interested to uh, provide this uh, technical and advisory service to uh, towns, urban areas, uh, cities, and others within the Pacific and, and indeed beyond, um, uh, looking at prioritizing, preparing for climate smart investments and programs. So that might be pre-proposal work, it might be uh, pre-scoping uh, work, it might be development of um, policies and program plans. So it's, it's quite open, but it's certainly something that's, uh, that's available. So it's ready now to take those uh, proposals and I'd encourage obviously participants to get in touch with um, uh, with the Global Covenant of Mayors, either through uh, the, the individual I said, and, and Steve can provide those details uh, later, or through Steve or myself. 
Uh, so perhaps I'll leave it there. Thanks, Steve. Right. Thank you, Bernie. Uh, yeah, a couple of um, quite immediate opportunities here, which is um, refreshing sometimes. We don't always get those opportunities. So that brings us to the end of a um, very interesting um, overview of the partners and previously, previous to that of many of the Pacific Island countries' plans and progress. Uh, and it's 20 past the hour. We're due to finish on the hour, which means we have another um, 40 minutes or so. So the plan now is to um, allow about half an hour for roundtable discussion. There have been quite a few questions coming through the Q&A function. Uh, and the roundtable is going to be facilitated jointly by Jane and by Alexi. And Alexi is sending out a chat now asking all the panellists to turn on the videos uh, so that there can be the sense of a roundtable. Uh, Okay, so I will turn off my video and hand over to Jane. Hi, thanks Steve uh, and welcome panellists. Um, I'm going to ask if we can uh, address uh, both people in the panel and people answering questions on a first name basis. I do not wish to imply any lack of respect, it's just that some of us know each other well, but we're all friends around the table with mutual interests, I believe, so I hope that that's agreeable. Um, now, it seems to me that, um, that this round table should focus on what the work plan of the Pipanua should be in responding to uh, the needs of different countries in the Pacific. And there's a couple of options here, I think, that emerge from, from our capacity and, and needs uh, in the Pacific. One is how we share learnings about really good initiatives and, and practices. We already had a webinar session and, and more webinars could be programmed. Um, so some of the topics that might be mentioned are housing policy, because there's clearly some experience in different areas. The building code, I thought, being developed in, um, in Micronesia states was of interest and there's work on informal economy policy and markets. So um, if we could get some ideas of topics that would be priorities for, our, uh, for the countries that we have represented on the round table. Uh, and then what are the top regional priorities for which we should seek donor support? So some of us work with donors uh, and we may be able to present uh, grant applications if we know what the key priorities are, and that could be country specific or regional. Um, so some of the questions in the chat are very specific from somebody answering a question to somebody who's given a presentation. I would suggest that they should be answered in the chat. Uh, but what we'd really like to hear from our country representatives is what would you like from the partnership? What do you think are the priorities that we should be working together on? So I invite uh, your, um, your questions to us and then we will field them to the partnership man uh, members. And just on a technical note, if, uh, if our country representatives are able to turn on their videos, that will make a much more uh, visible round table if you've got the bandwidth to support it. We can take some questions from the chat if you if you like. It's just I thought that a lot of those were very specific. What do you think, Alexei? Yeah, well, I think um, I can see um, Freya Aeli has a great provocation there, which is just about, I, I think would probably apply to all country representatives to some extent, but I thought maybe someone might want to just uh, either unmute themselves or put their hand up to tackle it. Um, Freya, I, I don't know if you'd be comfortable to answer that directly um, in, in, the, in the session. Uh, and and if, if you are, uh, please, please do introduce yourself. Uh, I'll just invite you to to talk if if you're comfortable to do so. No pressure, of course. Oh, apologies, you're on mute. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. <laughs> okay. Hi. I'm Priya Yeli, and I work for UN Women here at the Fiji Multi Country Office and uh, I had the Women's Economic Empowerment uh, Program. 
hence my uh, question about gender inclusive uh, public spaces. So I just wanted to know what are the country's plans, uh, you know, great presentations from the morning. So just in terms of uh, gender inclusive public uh, 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 facilities, just to know what are the plans that the countries have uh, maybe in the making or they have policies around this, just to know a bit more in this space uh, on gender inclusive uh, spaces, public spaces. Thank you. So, um, Alexa, we might direct this question um, to uh, to Valu, um, where we had some comment from um, uh, Lotta Tassi about the the gender specific training that um, we're providing there, uh, and how that was well received by the women, which is really about women's empowerment. Um, would you like to make some comment, or have we lost him? Okay, if we don't have Tuvalu on the line anymore, maybe somebody else would like to, to comment there. Lotitasi, could you comment? You, you said that the, the training was being well received by the women there in terms of women's economic empowerment. Exactly. They are really grateful and they are looking forward to this Saturday. Saturday this week. For the continuous, uh, the continuous of the continuing of the training, but they've already uh, shared with us that they've learned uh, the way in making uh, small businesses how to approach our leaders and partners in order for them to assist them in uh, in beginning sounding assistance in terms of beginning of their small businesses. That's what they have that related to us, but they are very happy with training. Thank you, Jane. Thanks, Lotta Tassi. Do any of the other country representatives want to highlight uh, initiatives they're taking? Hi, hi Jane. In terms of uh, one or two, uh, pillar number uh, under the urban economic uh, the government to encourage uh, women engagement in small business through roadside market and selling handicraft as part of the government uh, stimulus package to help uh, in this uh, uh, pandemic uh, crisis. Thanks, Jeffrey. So, do we do we have any um, any questions about what the priorities are for um, the partnership to deliver? Uh, for example, is there a topic you'd like su to suggest for uh, our next webinar that would be of benefit across the region? Um. Robert, you, in terms of the work you've done on the building code, do you think that's something that would be of general interest, developing a new uh, building code? Yes, and um, I must say that um, we would certainly love to learn from the experiences of other Pacific Island countries, largely because um, we are still at the early stages of our work um, to develop the, um, the FSM-wide building code. And um, I think that if we could have yes, some kind of regional forum uh, maybe to share experiences of different countries on the, um, on, the, on the building code, the process and so on. And some of the challenges which we understand will come later um, because what we have been advised by our experts is that the actual preparation of the building code um, is probably the easier part of the, um, the process. The enforcement and the implementation of the code, the capacity building, getting the legislation, getting the institutions responsible for en enforcing the code and so on up to speed. So certainly we would welcome some kind of a forum um, to share you know, the different experiences uh, within the Pacific. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, can I ask uh, me uh, partner members uh, who, if anybody would like to respond to that, do you think that that's something where we could add value to the initiatives being taken in different countries? Uh, Bernard. 
David actually had his hand up first. If I oh sorry, can Dave. just uh, direct it to him, <laughs> and then I'm happy to go afterwards. Thanks. I didn't see you, Dave. Trying to unmute. Uh, uh, it, it was a point about uh, some of the topics rather than the building code. Although I, yeah. I really support um, uh, the development of building codes. I've been involved in that in the past, and they are essential. I think to underpin uh, quality, uh, particularly in the housing, which is my field. Um, and I think the, the the topic I wanted to suggest becomes perhaps a core topic um, is one of housing. Um, it, it's came up in so many of the country presentations this morning. Um, as a housing uh, agency, we're very aware of how housing, good housing underpins health improvement, underpins educational improvement, uh, economic independence. Um, you know, it, it, it's a fundamental, foundational uh, area, I think, and, uh, and it's shared by, of course, all of us, wherever we are. Uh, so I'd like to suggest housing as a, as a core topic uh, for the partnership over the next year or two. And that's obviously a very big topic, so we might have to break that down, Bernard. Yeah, um, just uh, maybe quickly to uh, also react uh, to David and the broader topic. Um, certainly from uh, UN Habitat's perspective, we're also uh, very happy to provide uh, support on, on housing broadly. Uh, informal settlements upgrading specifically in terms of a regional informal settlements uh, upgrading strategy. But in terms of the building codes, uh, UN Habitat has uh, supported some time back, um, then also with Australian and New Zealand partners, the building code in Samoa, um, which um, was born out of a post-typhoon recovery response, where it was uh, very clear that uh, a good building code that can also be implemented is lacking. Unfortunately, we don't have some more on the call today, but uh, there is a lot of uh, very interesting experience, both in terms of the document uh, itself, but uh, very much in terms of the process that you uh, very rightly highlight, uh, Robert, as, as uh, very critically important. But we've also worked um, on building codes in other uh, small island developing states in, in the Maldives and uh, in the Caribbean. So there's also experience um, yeah, for similar settings in other parts of the world uh, that we can uh, probably share in this context. Thanks, Bernard. Uh, Mia. Uh, you have to turn you, uh, mute off. Sorry, there's always one. <laughs> good, af good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it is the virtual space that we're in, um, and it was a pleasure to be with you uh, when the last poof um, occurred, um, when I was there in Fiji. Um, look, really just to build on what Dave and Bernard said, and further to what Jane um, said this morning, or this afternoon for you, um, EROF does um, offer a range of training um, um, and housing is one of them. We do have um, experts in a number of our chapter countries um, and particularly in, re in relation to housing in Malaysia and the Philippines. Um, I'm aware that we have some really good connections with the National Housing um, Authority in the Philippines um, that could offer some uh, potential assistance in that regard. Um, my day job is actually in state government here in Victoria in Australia and we, we do have a building area and I'd, I'd be happy to follow up any inquiries that you might have. Um, I hope that might help. Thanks. So housing is a, is a very big topic uh, within which we might look at the building code and I guess climate action is clearly one that, that is across all of, all of the Pacific countries. Um, are there, are there particular topics within the broad um, umbrella of climate action that you think uh, would be particularly appropriate? I mean, some of us have talked about maybe developing a training program on how to develop climate action plans at the local government level. Um, but are there specific things that you think the partnership could deliver that would be useful for you? Or are you way ahead of it anyway? Um, if I may, um, in terms of climate action, and um, I, I want to touch on a problem, an increasing problem uh, that we are having in, in urban areas in the uh, Federated States of Micronesia, and this is the issue of urban flooding. 
Um, it, it is becoming um, a very serious uh, problem in several areas. Um, the, the frequency um, of it, uh, the intensity of it. And um, I do believe that our uh, municipal authorities um, are sort of unclear as to a way forward to address um, these problems. We will be, of course, in the building code. Yes, we will be ad addressing standards relating to uh, flooding of houses and so on, but it's a broader problem, not just housing, but even infrastructure, roads uh, being cut off and so on. So I don't know if um, in, in the area of, of uh, overall um, sort of broad umbrella uh, um, area of climate action, whether the, these issues of urban flooding um, can, can also be, um, be included. Thank you. Stanley, I might pass that to you because um, in uh, Honiara, uh, there's been quite a lot of work, obviously, with this um, very broad project to build climate resilience. Uh, but some of that has been about getting rid of the stormwater um, with the increased rainfall uh, and looking at uh, water management generally in the city. Is that something where you think you would be able to share some some experience that would be useful to other island countries you're on mute and and apologies i, I don't think that's stanley well the, the ps that i can see us just you've got the light behind you but i think that's oh, another right, colleague sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> i know there's quite a big team there at the ministry of lands and housing yes, and also just note uh, after after your response uh, good to see you steve um there's a face i recognize <laughs> Uh, and, and I'd also note that uh, that Robert is on the line from the Ministry of Provincial Government, and there are a lot of flooding issues in in particularly to the east of Honiara as well. So maybe after yeah. after there's been a response from the Ministry of Lands, we could have a response from the Ministry of uh, Provincial Government, if possible. Can you repeat that again, please, on the question of uh, that question that uh, is targeted to? So there is interest in learning more about how to manage increased flooding that comes about as a result of, of climate change. And I wondered if the substantial work that's been done in Honiara, if there's any sort of learnings that you think you could share that would be of general interest to other island states. Let me get John, I'm, I'm uh, out of date on that, but I know the World Bank has, has done some work um, funding the uh, Oniara um, oh. flood management project. So let me get John Clement to come and help us answer that question. Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot, but great. Uh, You've got a team there. Jane, it's Steve here. If I can jump in while my good yes. friend Hi, John, is, John is coming to the microphone. G'day, John. Uh, I just thought it's worth pointing out that in terms of climate change, when we talk about flooding and urban flooding, there are actually two quite separate phenomena that we're dealing with. Uh, and one is obviously heavy rainfall events, poor drainage, et cetera, you know, fairly standard urban flooding issues. But the other one, of course, is related with rising sea level. Storm surge, flooding yeah. much more, uh, storm, Not only storm surge, but even daily tidal high tide flooding uh, and the, the overland flow of that water, which can then contaminate well water, et cetera. So the sort of, there's two groups and the, and the yeah. approaches would not necessarily be the same. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that, Steve. And um, yeah, good for afternoon, or good for everyone. Can't um, hear you very well. Can you get closer to the mic? Sure. Uh, might, might, might be on the speaker. Um, <laughs> so yeah, World Bank is currently um, undertaking a flood risk study for Honiata. And um, I guess the challenging thing here, as um, yes, Stanley mentioned, is that there's a very rapid growth, uh, rate of um, urban growth. So uh, and a lot of the, the new growth is, um, is a kind of more modern style of housing with proper roofing. So you have a lot more hard surfaces and, um, and removal of vegetation um, when that happens. So there's that real uh, confluence of urbanization and, and climate change. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's, it's probably, um, there's more of a holding pattern message, but um, we'll, back, we'll be releasing the results of its flood, um, flood study. And I think there'll be some really important um, implications for other Pacific, um, yeah, other, other Pacific nations um, in there. And yeah, and as Steve mentioned, um, across both in Honiata and other urban areas of Solomons, um, there, there is also the, the challenge of, of rapidly rising sea levels. 
Um, so that's a, just kind of coastal elements to that. And then, um, and then certainly from the other city council is, um, is uh, factoring in um, changing uh, flood levels um, into its new uh, local planning scheme, which is, um, which is kind of about to be reviewed at the moment. So uh, that's it for me and Steve. On the housing side for the whole nation, there is a project being cooked right now, concept planning that is. Um, Save the Children is facilitating, and I think it's being funded by Green Fund. Green Climate Fund, yes, something, yeah. Um, which is targeting three villages to be, to, to, to go through village climate resilience uh, exercise, and there'll be three villages per, per province. We don't know yet when that is going to start, but it is being, uh, it's on the drawing board for uh, concept note. Great. Well, certainly there seems to be some interest in terms of retrofitting the, infra the hard infrastructure for managing water flows, as well as making housing more resilient. And Bernie sort of highlighted that there is this gap fund that where we can look at some new approaches and some proof of concept work maybe. Um, so that might be a topic to, uh, to consider. Um, in terms of, of the work we're doing with the small island states, there seems to be a common problem with uh, saltwater intrusion into freshwater aquifers. And obvious, obviously that limits freshwater supplies for drinking water and you can put rainwater tanks in and maybe address that in those ways, but, but it, it really affects the, the, uh, the growing of crops as well. Uh, and it seems to me that we might need some new technologies, membranes maybe, uh, obviously composting can help, but some, some techniques that we could suggest for stopping the salt water, killing off the crops as, as salt water rises. That I'm not, a, I'm not aware of models. I'm aware of techniques that could be put into developing a model. Do you think that's a, a common problem that is worth giving some, some innovative thought to? It might, for example, be something for the GAP program to look at. For the Solomon Islands, certainly that would be uh, interesting to the small atoll islands of say uh, Tikopia, Anuta, the eastern uh, province, or the eastern islands of Solomon Islands towards Vanuatu. So we'd be interested to participate in that. Yeah, I certainly came out with Tuvalu Lotatasi in the training program there. There was a lot of concern about that. Um, We've only, we're pretty much out of time. I'm just wondering what the mechanism should be for us to develop our work plan and to take ideas from you about a program of webinars and what the priorities are for assembling uh, grant proposals or, or other sorts of project proposals. I guess we need to set up some sort of a clearinghouse for suggestions and maybe even a voting mechanism so we can find out which topics would be of interest to most countries. Um, Bernard, have you got any ideas how that might work? Um, yeah, thank you very much, Jane. I think um, we had uh, proposed, and I think it was mentioned also in the opening, that we will be developing um, an initial uh, work plan. Um, at the moment, the steering committee for the Pacific Partnership for the New Urban Agenda is uh, driven by development partners with our individual contacts and feedback mechanisms to, to the countries, to the national and local government stakeholders. But at the moment, there is no formal mechanism uh, for the PPNUA to, to link into those. So I think um, that is one of the next steps that we have um, uh, some counterpart uh, mechanism within the countries where we can present this. I think um, more specifically, there, there will of course be uh, simple solutions like webinars that can be proposed by 
uh, the countries that are uh, in the meeting now, but also by the members of the uh, PPNUA, and we can move forward with those, responding to some of the questions uh, here. But the bigger programs, I agree, we will need that additional mechanism with the member states to develop broader programs and, and actually develop projects uh, where we collectively do resource mobilization. Now, we have established the, uh, a presence in the Solovaka platform, uh, and that does enable people to contribute ideas. Do you think that's a platform we should use for, for this, or would there be a, a better way of using something else? Alex, say perhaps you could comment on that. What's the best way of collecting ideas, do you think? I think we can we can probably follow up on that offline, I suppose, and, and, and down the track. But uh, I'd be always interested to hear from country partners what their preferred communications mode is. We did try having this streaming on Facebook with not much success, unfortunately, at the beginning. Uh -huh. but, uh, but obviously, there's a, there's a series of groups on there. And we've got a number of Facebook groups for the Pacific Urban Platform and other other sort of associated mechanisms that we'll build out of this. I, I can see Jeff, Jeffrey, you, you've got your hand up from Vanuatu. Oh, sorry, I missed it. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Jen. I think uh, my questions or comment here is to Bernard. Uh, I understand from the, the presentation from Vichy and Giri, but we were mentioning about the uh, Pacific uh, or slum upgrading program, uh, which they almost uh, up to phase three. Uh, for Vanuatu, we have completed uh, phase one, which is uh, event profiling for the three event centers. We have Port Vila, Luconville, and Lenakel town councils. Um, just wondering, uh, is there an um, opportunity to comment on the first two of the PSUD? And uh, my second thought about uh, this webinar is about the event policy. Now that we are the, under the development of the event policy, uh, I'm just wondering whether is an uh, opportunity to for the, the further assistance from this webinar or from the, the, the partners to assist us or the or to for for the finalization of the uh, national urban policy for one or two. Thanks, Jeffrey. We can certainly sort of put that on the list um, in terms of national urban policy and see if there's some way we can pool ideas from, from interested countries. Uh, in terms of um, informal settlement upgrading, I think that was one that we, we tossed to our Solomon Islands team. Do you want to comment on that, where you've got to? I, I think you asked uh, me also directly, if I very briefly can jump in. Yes, sure. we can discuss that, uh, Jeffrey. Um, Vanuatu, we had uh, earlier discussions um, two years ago at the Pacific Urban Forum for a number of uh, reasons um, that wasn't really taken up, but uh, very happy to re-engage on that. On the national urban policies, um, I think the entire network of the PPNUA partners are interested in that. Certainly UN Habitat has um, also a program that supports national urban policies globally and in the Pacific. So again, very happy to uh, discuss that bilaterally, but also more broadly uh, in, uh, in this group, maybe also with uh, a webinar to get that process uh, started or restarted. Uh, back to you, Jane. Okay, now I might hand over to you anyway, Bernard, because I think we're out of time for the round table. Um, but I think this conversation could, should consider. Um, so you might let us know uh, in general what you think your preferred platform would be for us to communicate as a group in developing the program, because um, we need to we need to do more work on this. Uh, but I'll hand over to Bernard for closing remarks and thank you all for a wonderful webinar. It's been great. All right. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jane. Yes, we are um, running out of time. So let me try to be relatively brief here, but I also do want to highlight um, some of the key outcomes, uh, some of the key statements that I've heard uh, today. And um, I think 
This has been um, excellent. Uh, there have been really very, very interesting presentations. And I think the breadth and depth of the ongoing uh, activities here are uh, remarkable. I think what is um, obvious is that the pillars of the new urban agenda uh, remain critical. I think it worked uh, very well for everyone to report against those, both uh, in terms of uh, the government uh, stakeholders that presented today, as well as uh, of the partners of the uh, PPNUA. Um, in addition to that, of course, we have added uh, COVID uh, for obvious reasons, and I think all of you have highlighted uh, the challenges uh, on COVID there. Um, I would in particular uh, like uh, to stress um, how um, amazing it was to see the progress since the uh, Pacific uh, Urban Forum two years ago, despite COVID. And of course, many of the specific programs and projects have continued and, and there remains um, a lot of commitment despite, again, the challenges that we've heard. But, um, I think what I am really uh, impressed with is that we've heard so much about uh, the new frameworks and policies that have been put in place. We've just uh, finished the um, quick uh, uh, roundtable discussions on national urban policies. In the last two years, two of the countries have uh, finalized their national urban policies. So I think there are now seven or eight national urban policies in uh, the region and uh, there is uh, more interest from Vanuatu and I think we've also heard from the Marshall Islands uh, that uh, they are interested uh, in this but we've also heard about um, other institutional setups uh, for example again from Vanuatu the setting up of, uh, of the new department uh, we've heard from PNG more on the on the side of uh, bringing local governments together through the new local government associations and we've heard about uh, efforts on housing policies resettlement policies uh, planning for frameworks and so on and also uh, in terms of uh, more the global engagement uh, through um, the urban dimension of NDCs. We've talked a little bit about um, the contribution through uh, voluntary local reviews um, and of course let me just also very briefly highlight the emphasis that everyone has placed on partnerships and we've heard of all kinds of combinations uh, of engagement uh, between national and local government and of course with uh, civil society uh, associations the private sector uh, academia and of course uh, the development partners um, let me not go too much into the um, the pillars themselves and the, all the many programs that were presented um, but just highlight uh, very briefly now um, the support that's been uh, offered by partners um, on all of those issues. Again, of course, the policies were highlighted by a number of us, um, uh, the climate change portfolio as well, and, and broader uh, governance and capacity development. There's been some mentioning on social inclusion, um, certainly gender, and, uh, and we've also been challenged uh, in this uh, conversation to do more in terms of um, public space and gender. We've also been uh, asked, and we haven't responded to that in the Q&A on, uh, on inclusive spaces uh, in the context of disability. So I think these are all uh, issues that um, I think many of us are uh, happy to uh, pick up on um, and of course the whole dimension of housing informal settlements were offered by many but at the same time were discussed uh, here. Um, so I think uh, we have already uh, identified a number of areas that are uh, critical to um, for many of us and to uh, pick up on. So I think, Jane, in terms of the question that you have uh, particularly um, asked me to respond on and how we are going to move forward in terms of our institutional uh, setup. So I think um, most importantly, uh, very happy to um, announce that we are most likely to get a full time uh, support for the secretariat for the PPNUA that will uh, certainly make the engagement easier at the moment. 
um, all of us have come together to advance uh, the support to uh, the Pacific. We know that the challenges are huge um, across a very vast area and uh, we are all uh, relatively small organizations in comparison to the challenges and uh, therefore this uh, willingness to collaborate uh, remains strong but of course the coordination across eight organizations hopefully a few more after this uh, webinar is, is also a big need um, and we've made a big step uh, towards that. So that's our institutional uh, next step but um, of course, as uh, Jane has, has highlighted, we need to now also move much more into uh, the engagement uh, with uh, national governments in um, the day-to-day -day work. We have established, I believe, much closer uh, communication in the preparation of this uh, meeting. Reaching out to everyone will be easier after this. We have also made huge progress uh, in terms of uh, connectivity uh, electronically. I think when we started this process, it was uh, very difficult uh, in terms of getting everyone on Zoom. Now everyone is uh, very much used to this. And I think that's um, a big step forward. Um, on Solovaka, I think we will need to explore how this works. I think the feedback that we have been receiving is that this is maybe um, not ideal. I, uh, we have, however, also internally said that we are very keen on not uh, creating a new platform, but uh, build on existing platforms. So maybe this is for us then a next step to, to build a little bit more the capacity, facilitate the access uh, to Solvaka. But I believe ultimately for us to go back to good old uh, email communication uh, for reaching out um, is, is something that uh, we will need to do and uh, to, to maybe strengthen. Um, I think we are all uh, just uh, as, as partners committed uh, to continue the work. We are also committed to building a new governance uh, element with uh, the uh, government representatives here. So we will develop uh, some sort of a um, yeah, or government oversight uh, function. We will probably start also relatively soon the preparation for the next Pacific Urban Forum, even though this is uh, two years uh, down the road, hopefully in person. But that will, of course, also help uh, accelerate uh, the communication. We will share the report, um, hope to get your feedback um, also in terms of the engagement mechanisms. And as I mentioned earlier, we will hopefully develop over the next few months an action plan and uh, engage with governments to see really where the priorities are. Um, maybe before I uh, close, let me just uh, then mention a few very concrete uh, next steps. Um, yes, uh, we'll send out the, the report of this meeting. Um, look for your feedback on uh, the the report that we will share with this. We uh, also, of course, want to get your feedbacks then on the on feedback on the next steps. Um, we have a number of um, other events that are coming up that provide for opportunities to take this forward. And uh, just to very briefly mention World Habitat Day, which focuses on uh, climate action, focusing on mitigation, and then that's on the 4th of October and the 31st of October is World Cities Day, Adapting Cities uh, for Climate Resilience, which I think is very relevant here. And we could uh, maybe plan to have a, a round table on that day, uh, focusing on the flooding issue that was mentioned. But there's also the uh, Innovate for Cities conference that was mentioned that is a global event, but we have uh, regionally curated events, uh, including the Pacific. So we can also dive much more, uh, yeah, much more deeply into this. And uh, we can uh, propose that to discuss that internally, how to move uh, all of this uh, forward. So I think there are many 
avenues of uh, engagement. Um, maybe just to mention uh, briefly um, or reconfirm national urban policies and, and housing uh, are certainly priority areas for UN Habitat, but as you've heard for many others, and we are certainly willing to advance that agenda. Um, so just um, to, to close uh, the meeting, um, a big thank you to, of course, the eight uh, country representatives uh, that have spoken, but also the many more government uh, representatives that were in the call, national and local government representatives, uh, thanks also to the eight uh, partners uh, of the Pacific Partnership for the New Urban Agenda, for the presentations, uh, for the willingness to engage and to partners. Um, of course, also thank you to, to the opening speakers and of course our uh, best wishes uh, through the government representatives of Tuvalu uh, to the Prime Minister, who unfortunately could not uh, join us. Um, last uh, but not least, um, a big uh, shout out to the team behind the organization of this, uh, the Pacific Partnership Working Group. Uh, the team has uh, engaged with many of the uh, government stakeholders to develop um, the uh, progress report uh, and uh, supported them in the presentations um, and of course coordinated uh, this particular meeting. So a big thank you uh, to Alex uh, Chatnam and uh, Solki and of course also the uh, technical uh, support uh, from uh, the University of Melbourne. Um, so with that, I would uh, like to close this meeting and uh, promise uh, once again that we will be in touch with all of you in, for the immediate follow-up, but also in terms of the joint planning of our future activities and to strengthen the implementation of the new urban agenda regionally in the Pacific, but of course in particular where it matters most in the towns, uh, cities, uh, communities across the Pacific. Thank you very much on behalf of the PPNUA. Bye-bye.